It is 7.02, let's call this meeting to order. We now have a quorum. As many of you know, this, these meetings are now being held via Zoom. If you are trying to call in to the phone, which I don't see anybody here trying to make that phone call, it is stars, I can never remember this, star six to raise your hand and star nine to unmute, or maybe I'm vice versa. Um, vice versa. Star, uh, nine star, to star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute. Um, if you're raising your hand already, um, I will get to you when the topic that comes up uh, is on the agenda. Um, as you will all notice, uh, the uh, public comment period was moved to the end of the meeting. Um, I will address that a little later, but for the time being, are there any brief board announcements? Seeing none, uh, if you, next up on our agenda is community reports. I don't, seeing as we have a meeting last week, I'm gonna highly doubt anybody's here for a community report, but if you are, uh, um, let's see here, please raise your hands. I do not see anybody raising their hands. So let me turn these on my agenda. with me y'all I'm, I'm trying to do two things at once because nobody has yet volunteered to be a secretary in this meeting so I'm doing it both. Yeah but Jeremy's got his hand raised I'm going to promote him for the time being I don't recognize the name but let's find out. Jeremy Hercules, your your mic is on is unmuted. You can speak. Jeremy, your mic is live. You can unmute yourself and speak. Yep. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, no, I'm just a public observer. I just I heard you suggest. Okay, not a problem. I'll, I'm going to disable talking, and if you want to speak later, just raise your hands. Sounds good. Thank you. Steve, your hand is raised. Go ahead. Yes, I just, uh, I, the, the board announcement came and went. I just want to say how saddened I was when I saw Gloria go at the next meeting and how happy I am to see her back. Hello, Gloria. Well, thank you very much. And I do appreciate all the voicemails and text messages and emails that I received. Um, I guess I'm fortunate to be part of the team. Thanks. Um, see, I forgot this part. Let's do a roll call. Um, if I miss you, let me know. I got Barry, Olga, Gloria, Jared, Crystal, Steve, John, Learman, Ken, Robbie, Dina, Terry, Gary, and Rich. I don't see anybody else in the... Visitors. All right. Uh, first time item on our agenda is the consent agenda. As you'll sell, tell, as you will see, the only thing on the consent agenda at the moment is the minutes from the September seventeenth meeting. Um, with the changes that John had requested, I incorporated. Are anybody? Would anybody like to remove an item from the consent agenda? Thank God. All right. Um, we will vote on this then. Uh, Ken. Yes. Crystal? Yes. Barry? Yes. Olga? Yes. Sue's not here. Terry? Yes. David's not here. Dan's not here. Paula's not here. I'm a yes. Rich? Yes. Uh, John Brand is not here. Jared? Yes. Robbie? Yes. Mike is not here. John Lieberman? Yes. Gloria? Yes. Dina? <laughs> Dina? Her mic's muted. You've got to unmute yourself, Dina. I'll tell you what, I will come back to you. Steve? Yes. 
Gideon is not here. Gary? Yes. And Chevy, we're voting on the consent agenda for the minutes. Yes. Dina, are you there? All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 14, zero, zero. It passes, or by consent, rather. Next up is committee reports. Um, I will make mine relatively brief, despite the fact that I wrote five minutes. Um, last month, last week's meeting was quite disappointing to hear the number of people who felt that utilizing freedom of speech, which I wholeheartedly stand behind, was an excuse to disrupt the meeting. That was not freedom of speech. That was not the right to share points. Um, and from that, for that reason, it was disappointing. As a result, unfortunately, I moved a public comment to the end of the meeting. Um, obviously, I, I think I would hope that it won't happen again. I would hope that people at least respect. If they want to share an opinion, by all means, they should feel every right to do so. Um, on the topics that are here, they can chime in. And if, uh, if it's an, something not on the agenda, they can speak about it at that point. Um, it was just, it was very disappointing and uncomfortable feeling to sit through and be told by the city that um, despite the fact that I would hardly think that that is not uh, freedom of speech being used in a public forum, um, I was told to listen to it. And for that, for the people that had to sit through that, I am sorry, but I could not do more. Um, finally, uh, assembly member uh, Kamlager Dove will be coming and attending personally our next meeting, at least that's what her um, staff has reached out and told me. So if you have any questions for the assembly member, please pair them. Um, I'm going to confirm that closer. So hopefully I will know for sure. Um, and if you'd like a confirmation of that, please let me know and I will gladly provide it and let you all know. Um, and we always put it on the agenda. Usually it's somebody from her staff, potentially it's somebody else. Um, with that being said, that will conclude my very short president's report. Um, next is changes to board committee membership. I know Dina, you would ask for one via email. Can you, if you can repeat that, I will add it to our minutes. And if anybody else has one, please let me know. Both Robbie and Chevy are not listed as having, um, any committee membership on the website. I don't know if they've expressed that they wanted to join one in the past and it's just not reflected on our website or if they still have yet to express that. Um, just so you, everybody's aware, you are required to be a part of at least one committee. Um, you can choose which one you want. If you want to, if you don't know, for the people who have not joined um, and you want to attend them and then make a decision, you're more than happy, to, well, more than welcome to do that. There's no, we won't, you can join them all, you can join one, but you've got to join at least one. Um, whether it's now or you want to hold off another month and feel them out and decide which one you like, that's fine. Um, I saw John's hand is raised. Go ahead, John. Okay, I looked at I looked at the list that uh, was prepared, and I'd like to get myself off of the following committees: education. Hold on, hold on. I'm just taking notes. Education. Yep. Land use. LGBTQ. And quality of life. Okay. Anybody else to join or lead a committee? Go ahead, Olga. Um, I joined transportation before I was on the board. I don't know if I need to rejoin as a board member. We will add you for the sake for these purposes. We'll add. We'll put it on today. Makes okay. It just as easy. Any but anybody else? Just for the minutes, which committee did Dina join? I think, hold on, Dina, Dina emailed her That was choice. Okay, that's what it was, I, I knew it was. Okay, Dina, Dina requested to join Quality of Life. She sent that via email, so I'm going to include that. Actually, that's, that's my apology, Charlie. Dina may have emailed you, but that was Chevy who requested to join Quality of Life, my apology. Oh. My mistake, Chevy. Charlie, I didn't want to join Quality of Life. Right, 
Great. Thanks. I, have a oh, I found the email, Dina, too. Sorry, that's both of them. Charlie. Oh, okay, good. good. So I will put them both. A uh, quick question, Charlie, for me. Yes, go for it. Are you also tracking how many meetings we're each attending for the year? I, I just, I know it's in the bylaws, but I wasn't sure if there's like a system. We do. We, we usually put them out in the past. We put them out once every six months or 12 months, but we have not done the greatest job of um, putting them out. We will likely try to get them on the agenda if I can go through it at that point. Um, at some point later this year, you are required to attend at least seven, seven meetings and you have to end some committee meetings. So please plan accordingly. Anybody else have any changes to committee membership? Yes, could you add me to finance? Sure. Yep, anybody else? Uh, transportation for Jonathan? Grand? Yep, you got it. Charlie, I'd left the note on the spreadsheet, but I, I asked a couple of meetings ago to be removed from public safety, please. I'm updating oh. the spreadsheet in real time, but somebody will have to go through and update the website. I will, I will, I will do my best to try to make sure to get that one done. Um, okay. Robbie, your hands raised, go ahead. Yeah, could I be added to finance and I heard finance, I thought, I, you see something else? By the public safety. Yes. Yep, done. Anybody else? Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I attended the last quality of life meeting, which ended up getting canceled due to lack of quorum, but I intended to join, is that? You can, you can join now, so that's fine. Right. <laughs> Just and I talked to Jerry about this. No, no quorum is required at a um, committee meeting going forward. Just at the general board, you need we need at least thirteen. Gotcha. Uh, that we do not need. So let me just double check to make sure he was here. Good. All right. One more um, thing. Sorry, Charlie. Just a uh, note on the spreadsheet that just I'm going to say out loud, so it's part of public record. Is Richard Bloom is a member of Public Safety. It's just not on our website. Okay. Yes, thank you. That, that, that was my understanding. Thank you. I will try to go through the, the, what, the spreadsheet and verify that and, and update the website at some point. It's not particularly difficult, but it just takes time. Um, are there any, with, with that, I don't see anybody else wanting to make changes. Are there any community, committee reports? I know we covered a lot of this last week, so or maybe not. I just left it on the agenda. All right, seeing none. Um, the next item on our agenda is the election of a new board member. It's the business representative seats. Um, Jonathan Tesler and Amelia Burroughs are the two nominees. Let me promote them both to panelists. Um, I'm gonna guess it's this job, it's the John, but I'm not sure. Jonathan, uh, your mic is live. This is this Jonathan Tesler? You hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to promote you to panelist. Hold on. I wasn't sure if that was the right person. All right. Um, we'll start with the uh, a one to two minute opening statement. I know you guys have both been here in the past. Um, once you get you an opportunity to give your opening statement, we'll ask for public comments. Um, and then we will ask for committee questions followed by your responses, at which point we will have to take a vote. Um, Amelia, you can go first. You're muted, you're muted, you're muted. No worries. All right, and here we are. Hello again. My name is Amelia Barras, and I am a comedy writer, performer, and entrepreneur that has lived happily in Pico Robertson as a proud renter for six years. I launched and operate a stand-up comedy community building show called Just Trying to Make Friends that has over a thousand followers on Instagram. I am a freelance comedy writer who has sold my talents to multiple TV shows and film studios, and I work with agents and managers whose income I supplement through my work. I maintain scores and scores of professional and personal relationships related to my work and come up with creative ways to build and extend my brand of comedy. I look forward to bringing the experience and voice of a new type of entrepreneur
entrepreneurship to Soros Neighborhood Council. My view of business is more product oriented rather than profit oriented. And that is something I'd like to see in the types of businesses we bring to and want to work with in our community. So whether it's housing developers or coffee shops, restaurants, manufacturers, merchandisers, hybrids, I wanna work with entrepreneurs who care about the work the product, the energy they're bringing into our community rather than solely the profit they can extract from it. I think it'll be an, I, I think I, it will be an asset to have a voice as a business representative that believes that when it comes to business, exorbitant profit at all costs actually shouldn't be the only goal. I believe that while profit is of course necessary as a means for keeping a business alive, the goal should be to provide the greatest possible product and service to our community. And I am excited to bring that voice and perspective to the council as a business representative. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megan. Jonathan, you're up. Thank you, Charlie. My name is Jonathan Tesler. I have been a stakeholder in Soro for the last 15 years. Father, husband. I am also a business owner and an employee of a company that is in the manufacturing automation world. I am also a public speaker, motivational speaker, and volunteer for nonprofits. My background is I was a TV producer and talent agent in a previous life. I retrained myself to be an engineer, taught myself factory automation, and now work as a control architect, control engineer in business development. I work all through the state of California as well as the state of Nevada. I have companies that I am responsible for like SpaceX, Tesla, Walt Disney, Universal Studios, and many, many more. I work with startups as well as large Fortune 500 companies. I'm in the business, business development world, but also as a small business owner, I get to work with um, small businesses like mine. I maintain an office in the Soro area, and I am um, very passionate about mentoring people and trying to get them into um, my in industry and help them grow. And I've, like I said, I've been in my industry for the last 20 years. Thank you. I appreciate it. I look forward, if I get your vote, to be a so Soro Neighborhood Council board member. Thanks, Jonathan. If there are any public comments, please raise your hands. Again, if you're on the phone, it's star nine. Otherwise, raise your hand and we'll call on you. Judith Feldman, your mic is now live. Hi, I'm Judith Feldman. I've known Jonathan Tesla for about seven to eight years now. And um, I know him and his family pretty well. We work in business together. We work as a family together. He's been in Soro for a long time. He's a great motivator, a great leader. Um, I was on a cycling team with him, which he led, had great ideas, very dedicated to um, all the causes that he, that he heads, um, always looking to help others, has always been a mentor, and um, is just a dedicated father, friend, and neighbor to all of us. Thank you, Judith. Uh, Jeremy Hercules, your mic is now live. Hi, um, yeah, uh, my name is Jeremy. Um, I've known Jonathan for roughly about five years for as long as I've lived in LA. Uh, I'm originally from the East Coast and uh, he was among the first people I met out here and has been an incredibly, um, uh, not to steal too many, uh, uh, what do you call it? praises from Judith, um, but he's been a, an incredibly motivational friend to have. And it's it's really helped me uh, to get acclimated out here. It's, it, he, knowing JT has really made um, LA seem like a lot friendlier place than I assumed he would, it would have been. At any rate, um, I've known him for uh, so many years through cycling, through business. I also work in the aerospace um, industry. And uh, that's largely due in part to some of the uh, um, advice that Jonathan has been able to give me in the past. Um, yeah, it's a great person. I think you guys should definitely uh, consider him. 
Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Manny, your mic is now live. Evening, everyone. My name is Manny. Just wanted to say that John Detester would be a great asset to the board. I've known him for over six years. I was on his cycling team and Jonathan has gone the extra mile to do everything for us when I was on the team and I'm very grateful. And he was like a big mentor slash coach for me who brought me up from uh, being just a rookie cyclist to now uh, still racing currently. And JT has been a big influence on my life and has maybe come up with some huge decisions along the way. And uh, yeah, I hope he gets your vote and joins the board and so you can really see what he does. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. Seeing no more uh, comments from the public, I will close the public comment period. Um, I will start because I know this is a question that we always regularly ask our board members or you know, appointees that are trying to get what uh, committee is or committees are interest of interest to you um, that you are considering joining as we, as you may have heard earlier, you're required to join at least one. So should you join the board, um, which one would be interested? I will let Jonathan go first on this one. Early, I think uh, to answer your question, um, out of the gate, transportation is really important to me as a lifeline cyclist and bicycle commuter. The roads are important to me, the upkeep of our roads, how we use them, how we share them to me is huge. I think public, public transportation is greatly needed and anything I can do to help promote uh, transportation other than cars is important to me. Um, I would also, as I mentioned the first time that I spoke, I would love to be part of a committee or a new committee that will deal with um, homelessness and our unhoused neighbors. I think it is super important. And um, as stakeholders, we need to have tolerance and patience as an EMT, a volunteer EMT. I work with our homeless on a regular basis and their health needs are huge. And it's something I think I can bring a lot of um, effort and uh, uh, success to. Thanks, Jonathan. Amelia, you're up. Um, also agree uh, with Jonathan. I like the, the new homelessness committee I would love to be a part of, quality of life committee I would love to be a part of, um, and also land use committee. I've been to a few of those meetings and would love to get even more involved in that in terms of, yeah, how we're using our land in our neighborhood and, you know, the types of developments, businesses that we're bringing into our neighborhood and also education, very interested in as well. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the board? Olga, go ahead. Can I ask some questions? If you can ask them and they can answer them both together. That would be a little easier, but uh, for sure. they're, they're kind of separate, but just to kind of wondering, um, what are your current involvements in the neighborhood council and the neighborhood? And what, um, how is your business dealt with COVID or how has it been affected by COVID since you are, you both are applying as business reps and I've heard a lot about uh, like the work you do, but I'm just curious about how you'll face this moment that we're in right now. Let Amelia go first on this one. So I've been most heavily involved in land use committee lately. I've been to several of those meetings. Um, and my business in terms of COVID, it's taken a major, the, the, the performance element of it has taken a big hit. Um, we had shows lined up throughout the year, in-person shows, and we switched to Zoom immediately afterwards. But especially because the, the, the type of show that we did just trying to make friends, it was so about in-person community building that we realized that the Zoom shows just didn't bring the same elements together that we typically loved. But recently, um, more stand-up shows have started doing shows in parks and just, just outdoor areas. So we're planning on bringing the show back now at reduced capacity with safety measures like masks and temperature checks. And um, 
and 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 I'm working on another show in in a new space outdoors as well that that will also have safety measures. Writing um, has actually pretty trans transferred pretty simply to COVID um, in, in in COVID life. You just kind of hop on a Zoom and do your work. Um, it's it's a little bit tougher with comedy just because timing has so much to do with comedy. So um, any kind of lag or especially if multiple people have an idea at once every you know people don't get heard and like sound stuff is weird um but it, it's definitely um it's definitely transitioned much easier than the live performance element but we're we're making it through and it's and we're and we're really having to change everything on the go and be creative and be adaptive and be accepting of realities and like and 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 change and grow um and it's something that we're excited about too, you know, I mean, like finding new ways to do things and, and bring things to people in this new and ever changing world. Um, so yeah, so that's basically it. Jonathan, your turn. Oh, good. Two very good questions. To answer the first one, my involvement with uh, Thorough NC has been limited up to this point. And the reason why it's been limited is one, I was involved in the Crestview Neighborhood Council which is, if you know about it, it's a small um, and not very well organized. Um, and that kind of fell apart in its own. And as some of the other people speaking on my behalf said, I managed a very large cycling team that was really set up, even though we were, it was about the love of bicycle. It was really about bringing people that weren't necessarily always like us, very diverse, and bringing us together so we could all work on building a better community, work on building better of ourselves to get better. And like all good things, that team I ran for about eight years, managed it, got sponsorship, all the dollars for it. And like all sports teams, eventually, if you're not professional, um, they come to an end. And time for that team to end. And my decision to do so was to do exactly this. I wanted to get more involved in my community. I wanted to be more involved with my family. And this was one of the ways that I wanted to do it. In regards to COVID, that's a two-part question for me. My professional life, I'm considered an essential worker. A lot of the companies that I work for, they make things. A lot of them quick, quickly had to start making ventilators, masks, PPE. And so we had to gear up very, very quick, quickly to help them design machines that could turn existing equipment into equipment that could make PPE. Um, that was from about February through about June. That was chaotic because regular business still takes, takes place. Um, and the biggest change for me was I'm normally on the road a couple of days a week, two or three days a week. Um, I became a desk job jockey. I'm in an office every day now for the most part. Um, I have to hold to very strict um, COVID restrictions and travel restrictions from my company. On my volunteer side, on the EMT side, it was chaotic. Um, we were taking uh, on a weekly basis, tens if not you know, more, 20 calls, COVID calls. Um, the amount of PPE we have to wear, the, the, the um, Safety precautions we have to take um, can be, uh, it's hard and it's tiring. And a lot of those calls come in, you know, three in the morning. And because we're volunt volunteers, we're giving up our sleep and we're giving up our, our time. Um, but I can say that we have made every call. We have not missed one call. And my, our response time is approximately 90 seconds from time of dispatch. I hope that answers your question, Olga. Thank you. Uh, any other questions before you vote? I do. Gloria, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure you both had an opportunity to speak to current board members about the experience on the board. Um, what unique perspective will you bring to the role if you are elected? Um, I will say, Jonathan, you can go first on this one. Gloria, I think that what I can bring to the board is my personal strengths are I am a businessman. I work in 
very diverse industry. I cover all aspects of business. Um, I am a really motivated person. I'm not afraid of hard work. I dedicate my time where it's needed. I have a saying, I get twice as much done in half the time. I live by it. I'm big on process. I'm big on procedure. Um, I like getting things done. Um, I understand the frustrations of things taking longer than you think it, think it should. But in the end, we all work on dead deadlines. My whole world is deadline. And I think that helps. I think also as an LA nat native, I've been surrounded by raising in the entertainment industry. I know it. Um, obviously, it's a huge part of the identity of Los Angeles. Um, I've lived here my whole, whole life. I've seen changes in LA. Um, so I think that what I can bring to this board is my diverse experience, whether that's an employee of a company, I've owned my own com company, I, I, I'm um, involved in sports, mentoring kids, consulting, public speaking, motivational speaking for schools. So I think all of that would help. And I do that all in spite of my stutter. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm gonna your turn. Um, so what, what I think I bring to the business representative seat that's unique is that I don't consider myself a business person. You know, I consider myself a people person. And I think that's a really important element to bring to our economy on a wider scale, but, you know, to our neighborhood on a smaller scale. I, I consider myself an entrepreneur, but I don't just consider myself that. I consider myself a human being. I, my, the qualities of mine that I am most proud of are my compassion, my empathy. Um, I really do love people. Um, and I, I, like I said in my speech, I believe prof is, is necessary, but not at all costs. I believe people come before that. And I think that it's, it's, it's probably not, it, yeah, it's, it's not probably a pop, probably not a lot of business reps have been very open about that. But I do think that we're living in un unprecedented times right now um, and times that call for unprecedented shifts and trying completely new things. Um, and so it's a, it's a prospect that I am excited about bringing a voice to the business seat that is not at all typical business. Um, and it's a prospect that I hope you guys um, are ex as excited about um, trying as I am. Um, I see Steve's hand is up. Go ahead, Steve. My question to Amelia is, given your comedy writing background, I don't know if you witnessed what's been going on at the board meeting lately, but it's been quite stern, um, to say the least. And I'm wondering if you think that your talent in comedy would be an asset, where it would be a value proposition to the board and uh, loosening tensions when they arise. My question to Jonathan is, um, I'm wondering what core, I, I mean, starting and leading a cycling team is, um, is quite a task at hand. And I'm wondering what is the core belief or the value that led you, that, 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 that motivated you to start a cycling team? Who do you want to go first? The first one I asked you, I suppose. Go ahead, Amelia. Um, so Steve, thank you. Thank you for a question. That's a super fun question. Um, I, I, I would hope. I mean, I, you know, I don't, th I, I mean, I never, I, I wouldn't be coming to the board meetings to make people laugh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I um, come to the show for that. I'll let you guys know about the show, but no, in, in I mean, in, in all seriousness, I, I would hope that I would bring a levity to the board. Um, I, I, obviously you got, you know, we're dealing with serious things here, you know, but I think that I, I do, I think that there is a balance that can be held and I, I pride myself, I mean, at the show, I run a show literally called Just Trying to Make Friends. And I pride myself on the fact that people come to that show all, in a city like Los Angeles that many, that many experience is lonely and distant and isolating. I've really created a community there where just, 
you know, d scores and scores of people have met communities of friends in the city that, and they're grateful to the show. And I really do believe that I have an ability to promote an environment of understanding and calm and where people feel comfortable being vulnerable with each other. I pride myself on the fact that I don't take anything personally. I pride myself on the fact that I know I'm not perfect and I make mistakes and I am I, I'm happy to be called on it when I'm wrong. I want to grow and change. I pride myself on the fact that I am a listener and I'm always trying to learn. And I learn from everybody that I meet and I know. And um, being a member on a neighborhood council would be a new experience for me, but I really do believe that I would be an asset to the, my, my, my voice, my unique experience, the fact that I am so unlike probably anyone that's ever been on um, business rep, I think would be an asset. Um, it would certainly be different, but I think it would be a good different. And I think trying different things, especially at a time like this, um, it is, is, is a good thing. And what's the worst that can happen? I'm terrible. And then you guys vote me out or something. I don't, you know, I, I'm just saying like, you know, uh, again, well, well, you know, what, what could, what could be the worst that happens? Um, and if somebody uh, don't answer that, or maybe, <laughs> it, well, well, anyways, that's my answer. Jonathan, go ahead. Your turn. So Steve, I love your question. Cycling has been a passion of mine since I've been a kid. I remember my first bike, Twin Stingray, Banana Seat, 50 bars. It was per purple. It was used. I loved it. I have always had a passion for the bicycle. It is the most elegant form of transportation. Um, I have been a bicycle commuter since college. Um, I love cars too, but I'd rather ride, ride a bike, and I have many. Um, I carried, I was a cyclist in college. I've been, I raced, started racing in college. Um, that was in 1983. I am still racing today. Um, and now I started as a junior and now I'm a master's. Um, I started the team because I looked at cycling and cycling teams in Los Angeles and they were very sterile. It wasn't about growth. It was about personal fulfillment. And it, it all looked like me. And I decided to do something different. And I started a team. It was around a website that I own called bicycle.net. Ca called it the bicycle.net racing, racing team. And the goal of it was everybody was welcome. You had to have a good attitude. And you had to love the bicycle. And we brought in people from all areas, all races, all sexes, all orientations, no one asked questions, everyone was welcome. And we did it as a group to help mentor each other. It was to, a way to create a family around cycling. I involved my kids, we promoted bike races, my kids came to them, they helped, they sold tickets. It was something that we did to better the, 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 the community, to, to better ourselves to better each other. And I have to tell you, it's one of the greatest achievements that I've done and I'm proud of it. It stands on its, on its own. I was sad when it ended, but it needed to. And someday would I do it again? Maybe. Um, it was a lot of work. It took a ton of time. It takes a ton of money. Um, it takes a lot of managing, you know, when you have 50, 60 athletes who are all eight, type personalities that are all, you know, trying to get better. Um, but I loved every minute of it. It was phenomenal. We have two more questions uh, and then we'll, we'll vote. Crystal, you're up next. I'm curious about um, both of your time commitments outside of SoRo and, you know, the NC, how much time would you realistically be willing, or not just willing, but able to devote to um, the NC and the work that we do. I'll let Jonathan go first on this one. Whatever, whatever amount of time it takes. Um, I'm a kind of person that does not like a unbusy schedule. I fill my time. I don't like being unproductive. Uh, 
very passionate about what I do. Like I said, I get twice as much done in half the time. Um, all joking aside, um, I want to be involved. I want to get stuff done. I want to, as I said before, in the last time we had to go, go around, I want to leave a better sorrow for my kids. I want to make them, my kids have told me they want to grow up here. So if that's the case, then what I leave behind, I want to look better than what my parents left for me and my grandparents left for them. I think I've told you before, I'm a third generation Soro native. My parents both went to Hamilton High School. My grandfather was a firefireman, station 91. Um, so I have roots here and I am willing to do what it takes to accomplish that, whatever that looks like. Jonathan, Amelia, your turn. Yeah, so in my experience so far, Soro meetings have been, you know, evening meetings that last three to four hours. Um, and like each committee, you know, meets once a week, I mean, once once a month. Um, and and that's, that's the ty type of stuff that I was just used to doing as a stand-up comedian, just like your night starting in the evening and then going out and like just doing stuff that like requires you to be kind of like present for many hours at a time because either you're on stage or then you're like talking to other comedians, et cetera, et cetera, studying the people on stage, et cetera. And, and, it, it, and I've just always just been good at, if I'm passionate about something, I'm just gonna make that time commitment and be happy about it. I'm not gonna, I learned in life that, you know, I'm, I, I, if I'm not, if it's not a F yes, it's a no, you know? So like now, whenever I go into anything that I do, if I'm not super passionate about it, I'm not gonna sign up to do it. So I know that I'm super passionate about neighborhood council. And so I am eager to make that space in my schedule. It's, it, again, it's at the time of night that I'm used to being super present anyways. Um, and it's just something that, you know, now it's like on my nights that I'm doing neighborhood council, I'm not doing shows that night. I just block off that night. I've already kind of started doing it since I ran for the uh, zone 10 rep a, a month ago, two months ago. I stuff to keep track of time, honestly, in lockdown. It was like one or two months ago, maybe two, three weeks ago. I, I don't know. Um, I could check my calendar. Um, but, um, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not concerned about the time commitment. Our Last question is from John. Go ahead, John. Okay, I, I have two questions and it's one of them is addressed only to you, Amelia. Uh, and the other one is addressed to the both of you. So I'm gonna to go to the one that's addressed to the both of you first. Both of you are running for the business rep seat. Why have you not considered trying to join the committee business advocacy and economic development? Good question. Um, Amelia, you're up first. Um, great question. Um, TBH, I am running for, to be honest, I am running for the business rep because it was, I, I really wanted to get even more involved in the council as a, as a board member, not just a member at committees. And so I ran for the zone 10 seat, didn't get that. This was the next one available. And once again, like I don't consider myself a business person, but the more I thought about being business rep and the more that I thought mm -hmm. about, wait, I mean, I am totally an entrepreneur. I just don't see myself as a business person just because again, like making a lot of money has never been that important to me, you know? Um, so I've just never thought of myself as like profit at all costs. But then once I, once I was, once, once the idea of running to, uh, for business rep kind of like presented itself to me, I kind of thought like, you know what, like I, this could actually be a good thing. I think my voice could actually be good here. It would be super different. It would be a totally different vibe, but I think a good one, you know, a good one to have, especially at this stage right now that our, like our country at large is in, but even our community is suffering from the effects of late stage capitalism. You know, I, I think like it's important to bring a voice that isn't just super late. In my opinion, I think it's important to have a voice that's not just totally focused, laser focused on like business, 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 and kind of brings like kind of like a more humanistic approach to it. But honestly, now that I've run for business, um, bu business rep, and you mentioned that committee, I wish I had said that committee in the earlier question that I was asked, like business, I would like to be a part of that committee now in all honesty. So I, I, I will try to make it to those meetings now. Thank you. Just to be clear, I don't think they've had one yet. I couldn't be wrong. Um, go ahead, Jonathan, it's your turn. So John, uh, great, good question. Thank you. Um, there's no reason why I would not. Um, 
initially what attracted me to the board was transportation and our ho our homelessness crisis that we are as a we as a community are suffering. Bad work. I don't mean suffering. There's such suffering, but as a community, we have to deal with it. I there's no reason why I wouldn't want to work with other businesses in the area as a business owner myself in the community. Um, I would want someone to reach out to me. I would love to be able to reach out to them. Um, I think that we need to support all small businesses in our community, including some of the larger larger ones on Robertson and um, would be happy to. It's really, I want to put my energy and my efforts where I'm going to be the most efficient and bring the most to the board. And if that's where it is, that's where it's going to go. John, your second question? Well, my second question is I wanted to know you just wanted to find what her real passion about Soro Neighborhood Council is. What attracted you and why are you attracted? Uh, after last meeting, I could see your attraction might be you like to learn all the dirty new words that are available off of Zoom bombing, but uh, aside <laughs> from that, uh, you know, I really wish we had two positions open that we could offer one to each of you. You each have different talents and abilities, and I think all of them would be welcome on this board. Go ahead, Maria. Do you like to answer? Um, thank you. Um, that, that, that's a great question. And, uh, my, my pull to neighborhood council is something that's actually been like several years in the making, several, uh, two I, I was really radicalized after the 2018 midterms um, in, in our, and, and radicalized in the sense of just like really feeling a desperate need, like a, a call to serve in some way. Like, again, like my background is like in entertainment, you know, like for, I, I, I came to Los Angeles wanting to be a TV writer and a, and a comedian, but just kind of Donald Trump's, after Donald Trump's election, I was really deflated and just kind of like extremely depressed. Um, but then after the 2018 midterms, you know, we retook the house. There was such a wave of progressive voices that really inspired me and made me realize, oh, what's gonna, what's, I realized like the solution to me feeling stuck and hopeless is that I'm not participating in the process. I'm not giving back. And so, you know, that's when I first started looking into things like neighborhood council. But again, like I'm, I'm a TV writer and a comedian. Like I, I was like, that's, i you know, that's not my wheelhouse, you know. Um, but then, you know, lockdown happened and I've just been, and it's been, it's kind of, been, it's forced me to kind of be inside and be super introspective about life and what am I doing and why am I pursuing what I'm pursuing. Um, and, 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 and then I first saw that and, and neighborhood council was always something that I wanted to do, but it was kind of like, it's hard to find a way in unless you're kind of like called in by something or someone. But then I got that email saying like, we're having elections, you know, you should apply. And I was like, it's, they're talking to me, you know, I mean, they weren't, but like, it, it, it would just seem like such an, like, oh my God, I can really just like apply and then run and all that. And then after I ran the first time, I was like, I made, I made friends with people who also ran and like, kind of like found a place of like, you know, people that cared and wanted to make a difference. And like, you know, I, I know people on the council now or who participate in committee meetings and like, I'm already kind of finding a community within it. And then before I even joined the, the started volunteering in the council itself, like, I, I, I don't know if you guys remember from my, my, my speech um, when I was running for zone 10 rep, but like, I started a uh, weekly, now it's on Wednesday mornings coffee hang with just like neighbors of mine that I would have never met if I hadn't kind of just been stuck at home, stuck around my area, you know, forced to really meet the people around me, you know, I mean, I have a coffee, um, group now every every wednesday i meet with my 65 year old um japanese neighbor mark and my 97 year old neighbor annette and we all get and we have and i, and I just met them because i was having coffee with other friends on the sidewalk and like I just met them through conversation and they were just like they wanted to make a connection and I just like realized our neighborhood is desperate for connection you know like we all we all want to know each other better we all want to be closer to each other like and I do and I have always felt like I am able to kind of foster those kinds of connections and community and it's and it's a passion of mine to kind of bring that to to whatever it is that I'm doing um so it all kind of felt like it was 
all like happening at like at the right time. And then, you know, I got the email to apply to run. And then ever since then I felt more connected to the council and then, you know, this thing happened and now I'm running for this. And so it's kind of, it's kind of just like something that snowballed. Thank you. I don't see any more questions. Um, to be clear, this position is, uh, for business seat, it expires at the end, at the middle of next year. And um, that is the end of the term that you were running for. Um, nope. to address one of no, no, it expires 2023. No, it's Martin's seat. Martin's seat. Martin, Martin ran Martin when we did. Just, Martin was in the, the, the 2019 election. Really? I believe yeah. it was the 2017 election, Ken. I can go back and check. I don't think so. I know Martin was elected the same time that I was, so he was just reelected. Let me just double check it. I want to be sure. I don't even have that information. Yeah, it would be awful to stick one of you for an extra two years that you didn't anticipate. Hey, John, that's not fair because uh, someone was got elected for four years and we're on year number five now. So I don't think that's particularly fair either. Um, yeah, it's 2022. Okay. Um, which is now, I think, 2023 because of the change. All right, so I, I stand corrected. Three years, and just and to be clear, to answer one of John's points, um, there is a gen rep seat that is available at the next meeting as well. Um, I know uh, one of you has already applied for that seat should you not get this one. Um, obviously, we will cross that bridge later. So with that being said, um, it is now time to vote. Uh, Ken. Uh, Jonathan. Crystal. Elia. Barry. Jonathan. Olga. Amelia. Terry. Jonathan. Rich. Jonathan. John Brands. <laughs> Jonathan. Uh, Jerry. Amelia. Robbie. Jonathan. Mike. Jonathan. John Lieberman. Jonathan. Gloria. Amelia. Dina. Jonathan. Steve. Two good candidates. Jonathan. Gary. Jonathan. And she Chevy. Jonathan. Oh, I abstain, sorry. Um, Jonathan wins the seat. Congratulations, Jonathan. Um, I didn't say this. Amelia, I do have your application for the next month. You will be on next month's agenda. Um, there are a few others so far, um, but if you are interested in voting for Amelia, she will be on the, in, on the ballot for the gen rep seat coming up at the uh, November meeting. So, um, but Amelia, we do encourage you, if you do wanna join a committee, you are more than welcome to join. Um, they're on the website and of course, if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me or any of our executive board members. All right, um, let me move you back to attendee. Jonathan, congratulations. Um, you will likely not be eligible to vote on many of the items or any of the items today until you finish the code of conduct and other and ethics courses, but of course you are welcome to join in the uh, debate on all the items. Um, the next thing on our agenda is the uh, election of, a, of new board officers, the secretary. Anyone, anyone, anyone? Bueller, anyone? No, no, all right, I, I had to try. Um, if any of you is interested in running for the secretary job, I will continue to take notes in the meantime. Um, but it does mean that that count for attendance will probably be pushed back a little later on that because nobody's doing it for me, so. Um, with that being said, I will wait and I will keep putting it on the agenda until one of you changes your mind or gets worn down and finally says yes. Charlie, hope springs eternal, but I would like to add that if the issue in keeping any of us from applying for that is the taking of notes for the uh, minutes, that can be worked out with perhaps uh, hiring a, a note keeper 
and then your, your job is to certify the notes. So it won't necessarily be as burdensome. Truth, truth be told, I don't overly mind taking notes. It doesn't bother me. They're, 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 right now, um, more importantly, there is uh, the, the secretary is also the chair of the board development committee. Um, and just as mentioned, um, Marge had reached out and said that they, given Marge and Doug's long history on this board uh, about trying to put something together in terms of board development to assist all the people especially the newly joined people and those the two that will potentially join in November um, with providing some of the um, assets for lack of a better word, I can't come up with at the moment um, that are available um, for us to use in, in, in order to do our jobs better. So they do have a lot of experience. They want to try to put them together. Um, so if somebody wants to Volunteer, you can reach out to me and hopefully help me put that together. Even if you're not technically the board development, thank you. I saw, I saw your hand, Gloria. So that is that is not gone unnoticed. Um, but I do think, given how we've added half know, half a dozen people in the last few couple months, and we've got two more coming in, um, knowing what's available, especially given the fact that we're not all together and we're via Zoom, but there's a lot of still a lot of stuff that can be done. Um, that we try to do that as well. Um, all right, on to the next uh, agenda item. Motion to support a letter, to submit a letter supporting Venice Boulevard for, for all. It's from the Transportation Committee. Um, John, um, it, you are, what, is, is, your, is your committee, would you like to present this one? Uh, I, I will, I think I'd like to defer it to Olga because she basically picked it up from uh, the committee uh, when uh, Jessica left. This was originally brought to the committee by Jessica, and it's a good motion. It basically is saying we have a street that is now become a street that's owned by the city. Prior to that, the street was considered a uh, highway and was basically owned and operated by the state of California. Uh, I could continue talking, but I don't want to intrude on you, uh, Olga. So if you want to pick up from there. I can, I can chime in whenever you'd like. Um, I actually want to point out, uh, I'm sure all of you noticed, we got quite a bit of support for Venice for All today from a lot of the community. Um, uh, I think the, the Venice is big for commuters. It's the biggest connection between East and West LA. Um, it is a massively wide street. And as a cyclist myself, um, it takes me about as long to bike down Venice as it does to drive in traffic. So I think a lot of people see Venice as an opportunity to create actual bike lanes because right now, while it is one of the best uh, connective roads in LA, uh, it is, harrowing to bike on. It is absolutely terrifying. Um, you have bikes, cars, and buses all sharing the same lanes. And despite being so wide, none of those lanes are separated or protected. So Venice for All is uh, an initiative to change that and make Venice actually safe. Um, a lot of you might know, uh, I remember Jessica uh, was hit by a car in our area. I was actually hit by a lift uh, a couple years ago. Our neighborhood has one of the highest hit and run rates, especially in that region. Um, and Venice for All would really make this area a lot safer. Um, you can check out the letter. It's really well written, but um, basically it would just uh, make Venice so much more pleasant for everybody walking down it, you know? Even uh, even like taking a walk on it is so unpleasant because you just have like so much traffic wishing by and um, uh, Venice for All aims to change that. And uh, uh, something I did not know about this that I read in a few of the comments we received was about how much of an economic boost it would be to businesses based off of something similar that has been implemented in other cities. Um, so anybody who hasn't yet, I encourage you to take a look at that letter and the comments we received. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions about it and um, uh, happy to hear what other people think. Are there any technical questions from the board? This is just to be clear, this is not board debate, just technical questions. 
<laughs> I'm going to raise one, uh, and I believe that parts of Venice have this already. I don't know if you're familiar with it, Olga, but instead of the familiar way of having uh, sidewalk, parking, bike lane, there are parts of it where it is sidewalk, bike lane, parking, so that the space between the sidewalk and the parking is kind of a protected bike lane for the bicyclists. Uh, uh, I, kind of, however, uh, biking through there, doors flying open is very much a hazard and uh, like one of the biggest reasons I almost die every time I bike through one of those. So it's, uh, it would, I mean, that's definitely a step in the right direction, but I think many cyclists will agree it is nowhere near as safe enough as actual like uh, guarded bike paths. John? Uh, I have a question. Just, just a reminder, these are technical questions, not more debate issue related issues, just to be clear. Yeah, uh, oh, question. Could, um, can, Olga, can you describe that a little bit better? What do you mean a guarded bike path? Like a protected bike lane. So it has like little poles so that like a car couldn't swerve into it. It has barricades to protect the cyclist. As opposed to right now, most of LA's like protected bike lanes are just on the inside of like a car parking spot where if somebody swings their passenger door open without looking, uh, they can still hit you. It really depends. And the few areas that do have that minimal bicycle protection, uh, there's really not that many of them. Uh, and uh, this, this Venice initiative actually goes all the way from mid city to the ocean. So it's-, it's So perfect. just question, just for clarification, it sounds great, but what I don't understand is that if you do have this guard path and cars are supposed to park to the right of them, how do they get in? Cars park to the left. I see, okay, thank you. Hey John. Go ahead John. As a commuter like Olga, I have ridden Venice hundreds and hundreds of times. And the problem that got run into when you were dealing with Venice on the very West end, when they put in a quasi protected bike lane was that residents didn't like it. Drivers, especially commuter drivers didn't like, like it. And you would find car drivers confused and actually driving in the quasi protected bike lane and caused almost more casualty and damage to cyclists than before. So I think that my, my question would be, how do we educate the driving public that uses it basically as a highway going, you know, west to east and east to east to west? Uh, in what part, regarding the bike lane? I'm just saying when you put in a bike lane and protect it, is it gonna be fully, fully guarded off? Yeah, it, it would be barricaded, yeah. Okay. And beyond that, I think you have to treat bike lanes that are protected the same way you would treat crossing okay. for the metro lines. You have to have guys. Guys, we're having a discussion about the actual merits of this motion, as opposed to questions about what the motion says. Terry, your your hand is up. Technical questions only, please. I'm sorry about that. Um, you, you two that it actually increases business uh, economics. Can you cite the study that that actually is? And secondly, from looking at the renderings and then also the uh, documents, it looks like when they put the BRT in, it actually removes uh, street parking. Can you clarify that? Because it's very clear in the documents and also in the, uh, in the, uh, Render, the artist rendering that they had, it actually eliminates the parking. And when you look at how wide Venice Boulevard is, it, it with the, the lanes, 12 foot lanes and that, there's not enough street. So can you explain that? Yeah, for sure. Um, it, it does not uh, eliminate all parking. There might be some spots where it does, but it's not the entire thing. And uh, the rendering is not the actual plan. It's just an example of what it might look like. Um, and then lastly, the study it came from, it was actually uh, a few people sent it over to us. I'm trying to pull it up now. 
Um, but I did, sorry, we got so many emails. So the study wasn't looked at in the transportation committee? What do you mean? That's a yes or no. During the transportation committee, did they look at the economic benefits of this by a document? I don't know because I wasn't there. I'm just explaining it because John asked me to chime in. John, do you well, can John answer that question for me oh. since I'm the business rep along with the others? No, the document was not provided at the time it was brought up before the transportation committee. Okay. Um, uh, Terry, I wasn't gonna cut you off. Sorry about that. No, no problem, all right. Um, we'll open up to public comment. Um, I'm gonna, I apologize if I butcher your name. Christopher Legras, your mic is now live. You are one of the like one in 50 people that got my last name right. I appreciate it. It's Le Gras like Mardi Gras. Stop. Uh, the broken clock is right twice a day. You <laughs> go, go, go ahead. Uh, I'm co-director of Keep LA Moving. And um, Olga, John, Jonathan, you're not going to like my opinion very much, but I hope you'll, you'll listen. Um, the, you know, there are three main arguments in, in favor of road diets as we call them on major thoroughfares like Venice Boulevard. And, that, and by major thoroughfares, we mean 20,000 ADT per day or more. That's average daily trips. Um, safety, business, and environmental benefits. Unfortunately, experience has shown, and this is true across LA as well as nationwide, that um, none of those arguments really hold up. And I'll give you a few examples. When Culver Boulevard and Playa Vista were road dieted back in 2017, on Playa del Rey, and, and you can look this up on the CHP, California Highway Patrol, Switters database, and Switters is the statewide integrated traffic record system. In four months after the road diet went in, there were 54 injury accidents. That compared to fewer than 12 every year before the road diet went in. 54 in four months versus 12 per year. We've seen similar data points. And again, it's not statistics, it's data. You can, you can verify this on the 0.8 mile road diet that has been implemented on Venice Boulevard and Mar Vista. Overall accidents are up 25%. Injury accidents are up 25%, excuse me, 20%. Um, pedestrian accidents have doubled. And again, that's, that's state data, that's not me talking. Um, overall in Los Angeles, since we started really implementing these road diets in earnest as part of Vision Zero in 2015, between 2003 and 2015, there were an average of 84 pedestrian fatalities in LA per year. And I think we can all agree that's 84 too many. Between 2015 and 2018, it went up to 135. And if you look at the chart, and this is, by the way, the, the Vision Zero Task Force own report, 20, 2018 Vision Zero Progress Report. You can look it up on Metro. Um, pedestrian fatalities increased 70%. And again, it's a hockey stick. Nationally, we have seen similar statistics. We see it in DC, in New York, in Seattle, um, in Portland, ironically, which is a big bicycling hub. And, and, and I should emphasize, nothing of what I'm saying is anti-cycling, is anti-multimodal transportation. I think we all agree we need to find ways to get people out of their cars. Unfortunately, Vision Zero and road diets, like the one that is proposed to be expanded on Venice Boulevard, is, is simply not the way to do it. And this is, again, data, not statistics. Um, a second issue is businesses. Chris, I want you to try to let time so you can please kind of wrap okay, up. Okay, I'll shut up. I'll be done in a minute. <laughs> um, uh, 
we are told that road diets like the one proposed for Venice Boulevard are uh, boons for business. Well, again, on that 0.8 mile section of Venice Boulevard that has already been road dieted, 40 small businesses have failed and that's pre-COVID. And I have talked to about 25 of those business owners and they all attribute their failure to the road diet. And lastly, I would say that we talk about emissions, that getting people out of their cars and, and road dieting, et cetera, will improve air quality. Well, again, if you look at the Venice Boulevard for All website, they say that the, the road diet will only increase commute times by one minute. Okay, well, Venice Boulevard is a 40,000 ADT road. Now let's cut that in half and let's assume that 20,000 are during commute times. If you multiply 20,000 minutes times five, that's 100,000 minutes times, and I'm, I'm really discounting here, times 45 weeks, let's assume no holidays, et cetera. You're talking about 4.5 million minutes of additional emissions which equates to 75,000 hours of additional emissions. And so by all of the three metrics, safety, business, and environment, road diets on major arterials, again, we're not opposed to, road, to bike lanes on other streets. And as a matter of fact, we, we support them. My co-director is an is a avid bicyclist. He was a competitive cyclist in college. We're not anti-bike, we're not anti-pedestrian. <laughs> But on these major thoroughfares, again, not just in Los Angeles, but nationwide, data and experience show it's a bad idea. May I just ask a quick technical question? Sure. Uh, where is Keep LA Moving based? I just Googled it and it says it's a Manhattan Beach organization. I'm just curious if you're in Soro or LA. No, we're, we're, our business address is, is Manhattan Beach, but we're, we're statewide. And actually, we have a a co-group called Keep the U.S. Moving, and we have about 20 um, groups around the country, including Manhattan, New York, all over the country. So we're, we're nationwide. Okay, got it. Need to interrupt really quick. Charlie, Paula's and the attendee thing needs to be promoted, please. Thank you. Yeah. For sure. That's our hand up. Um, Paula, I see we were just trying to get into the meeting that correct not not speak on this topic at least not yet yes okay sorry i didn't i only saw first name i wasn't as of after last week's um wonderful meeting i'm always hesitant to promote somebody if i don't see last name um michael schneider your mic is now live Hi everybody. So just a couple of things. Um, the comment that was just made, the 75,000 hours of increased emissions, it's total garbage and nonsense. It totally ignores the fact that if there was a safe bike path where people actually felt like they weren't going to die using it, a lot of people would not use their car and actually could get on a bike or potentially take the bus. I also wanted to give you some stats to refute the nonsense you just heard. Um, this is data from May 2017 to May 2018, post the changes in Mar Vista. There were no severe or fatal injury collisions one year post project period compared with two severe injury crashes in the year pre-project. The upgraded bike lanes have resulted in a decrease in bicycle injuries and a higher proportion of cyclists are using the bike lane instead of the sidewalk, which is much safer for pedestrians. There's been a reduction in the number of collisions due to speeding vehicles. The busiest intersection, Venice Boulevard and Sentinella, saw a 75% reduction in collisions. Traffic volumes returned to pre-project levels, meaning the new roadway design handles the same vehicular demand with one fewer lane. Um, and in peak period travel times, in other words, rush hour, for less than 10% of the day, current travel times are about 30 seconds longer than they were pre-project. Um, and it boomed in terms of people walking and using the street by bike. Um, the counts increased by 11% from 981 to 1,090 for six hour period and cyclist counts um, increased as well. Pedestrian counts increased 32%. It was a much more pleasant street to walk down. Um, and that's the reason why the city decided to make it permanent. Keep LA Moving is an organization that tries to fight progress and therefore um, is against solutions to climate change all over the city. And I would really encourage you to 
discount those comments because they are not representative of the community and they certainly don't um, don't uh, realize that uh, many people would actually get out of their cars if they had a really good alternative. But if we just keep 99% of the space for cars, they don't get a good alternative. So I just wanted to, oh, and lastly, Jonathan's comment, how do you prevent cars from using the bike lane and getting confused that was said earlier. Um, I wanted to let you know that in downtown, they had that problem too. And they solved it by putting what is called a bollard, which is basically a post in the ground in the middle of the bike lane. Um, at intersections. So bikes can still pass pretty easily, but a car physically cannot pass. And that was able, that's a very simple and inexpensive solution to make sure that cars don't inadvertently or on purpose use the bike lane. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. John Beckhart, your, your mic is now live. Hi there. Um, my, name is, my name is Jonathan Beckhart and I, I want to echo and, and further some of the comments from uh, Michael Schneider Privacy previously. Um, first of all, I would say, you know, I feel like a lot of times these comments are focused on current bikers, but I, I do think the right way to look at this, this is future bikers. I'm a regular commuter across Venice Boulevard on bike. I will probably do that no matter what. It does not feel safe, but I'm committed to that. But when I talk to people, friends, neighbors about why they don't, the number one thing they say is they don't feel safe. So it's really about making the roads safe so we get people out of their cars, cars and create a network of bike lanes. Um, and then the other thing I would just say is, is, I think a lot of these issues come down to how we see these, how we see these roads like Venice Boulevard. Do we see these as highways uh, traversing our communities or do we see these as commercial corridors and, and central to our communities? And I think if we see these as central to our communities, it's essential that we build multimodal transportation alternatives across them. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no more public uh, comments, no hit up. Oh, pardon me, I got one more hand raised. Linda, your mic is now live. Hi everyone, it's your old friend. Um, so I just wanted to um, voice my support for um, improving Venice Boulevard. As many noted, it's pretty much a freeway at the moment. Um, I am a biker, driver, walker, and I pretty much only use Venice to drive because it is, as Olga said, incredibly dangerous to, to ride your bike on. Um, but I would like to be able to ride my bike on it because it's actually a very convenient street to be able to get from point A to point B. I have to travel, you know, three times the distance to do what I would be able to do on Venice if it were more pleasant. Um, I also want to refute these um, anecdotal accounts of businesses going under because of these street improvements. I invite everyone to look on the corner and you know, while the Great Streets project is very different than what this project is, I do invite um, people to look at the corner of Grandview and Venice in, in, on, in Google Maps, there's a photo from before the Great Streets Project was, was put in and after, there were no businesses on that street, on that corner. It was all underused commercial property. And now there are um, restaurants, salon or salon, barber shops, um, coffee shops. I, this is another anecdotal um, point, but it is a visual, um, a, a visual record of how this can improve businesses. And given that we are concerned with the survival of many businesses right now, it's incredibly important to create environments where people are able to drive to these neighborhoods instead of driving through these neighborhoods, which is what Venice is on the most part. It's a freeway, you don't really wanna stop. And if you do stop, you stop at one place to get something. Um, and these, these, these are not just anecdotal statements. They're backed up by the Federal Highway Administration. They're defended by the New York Department of Transportation. The studies are online, you, you wanna look them up. Um, I'm not just talking to 25 business owners and then reporting what they allegedly said. These are research, peer reviewed research um, papers that provide all this information. So this is not just advocating through conversation, it's what the data say. Um, and uh, you know, as a resident in this neighborhood, I hope to see, the, see, the, see these improvements. And I think it would really um, you know, help the character of this neighborhood as many argue for. Um, and I hope this board votes to support it. 
Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Um, Je uh, Jenny Mor Morataya, uh, your mic is now live. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Hi there, yeah, my name is Jenny and I'm a driver, a transit rider, a pedestrian and a bike rider and I fully support the, ben <laughs> the Venice Boulevard for all effort. Um, approximately half of all trips in LA County are three miles or less, which is generally a distance that can be biked. And a quarter of trips are under one mile, which is a distance that can be walked. And a third of trips are, um, a third of trips of one mile are less, um, are currently driven. So the intent for projects like this is not to force people to travel differently, but to provide an option for just to different users. Um, if LA had more protected bike lanes, I think that more people would feel safer riding a bike on the street and we can reduce our dependence on cars. And I think this would also grow and, and connect to the existing bike network, which right now is very small and we can help people safely get, get them where they need to go. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Till, your mic is now live. Oh, hold on. Um. Till, go ahead, You're, you are live. We can't hear you. Are you muted? I don't think so. He's on an old version of, of Zoom and it's not allowing me to oh. throw him to a panelist in order to let him speak. Till, would you like to, we can't hear you. Would you like to try and call in and, and speak or use a different version of Zoom? It, otherwise it's not working. I'm going to give him half a minute to see if I can let him in because I know he's trying to speak. Um, just to be clear, um, we only we only allow public speakers one time per person. So Chris, while I see your hand is raised again, we try to limit that to only one public comment per person. And that is our standard rule. Um, Do we want to answer any technical questions from anybody? I think Terry got booted, hold on here. Um, Bela, your mic is now live. Hi, thank you. Um, I just th thought I'd fill in the, the time here while we're waiting for that other person. I would love to see Venice Boulevard be a bike friendly, pedestrian friendly. I'm from New York. I spent my whole life walking the streets of Manhattan, going everywhere, a bus, <laughs> bike, um, I, I like the idea and I hope that we can actually succeed in producing that, um, that is safe for everyone and the businesses get to continue and flourish and we have a better looking, uh, cityscape for Los Angeles. Thank you. Thanks, Bela. Till is back on, so let me give Till one more chance to try. All right, Till, your mic is now live. All right, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> so much for the Chrome extension versus the Zoom app. Uh, you know, we're all getting used to this uh, COVID, COVID environment. Um, so uh, I, I, to be clear, I'm not a resident of the Soror neighborhood, but I am uh, a resident of the Pico neighborhood. I've been a Venice commuter for many years, including uh, about four years as a bicycle commuter. And I've also used other modes of transportation like uh, commuting by bus, by car, and even by motorcycle. And um, I'm super, super excited about this Venice project because, you know, honestly, when I have uh, visitors from other parts of the world uh, who live in big, big uh, cities, when they hear that, you know, on top of our very famous LA traffic problems that our buses are stuck in traffic, they just can shake their head, you know? And that this was, this project would add a dedicated bus lane, which has, um, a, uh, a throughput of two and a half to 13 times. I can say only 13 times as many passengers as a, as a uh, regular uh, car lane. Um, <clears throat> you know, that would really be a massive improvement, uh, a game changer. Um, 
And in, in uh, New York City, where I've written a little bit, uh, um, they have actually seen uh, uh, approximately a 50% uh, retail pickup uh, when adding these lanes. Um, as a bike commuter myself, I've had many, many close calls on uh, Venice Boulevard, uh, you know, cars passing in a bike lane. We heard about this earlier. This will be prevented with this project. So I'm super, super excited. And uh, I really hope that you will support this transformative project on Venice Boulevard. Thank you. Thanks, Till. All right, I don't see any more public comment. So public comment period is now closed. Would anybody like to move this forward? They move it. I'll second. John? I didn't catch, who was that, who seconded? And uh, Olga. Olga. I see a comment, um, Crystal. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I strongly support this motion. Um, I've lived and worked off of Venice Boulevard, just like a half mile stretch of Venice Boulevard for 13 years now. Um, I walk to work, I walk to the grocery store, I take my kids to school, um, I go to the park all via Venice Boulevard as not a biker, but a pedestrian. This is Venice Boulevard for all, you know, it's great for bikers, but it's also just for people using Venice. Um, not just, you know, even as a driver driving down Venice, this would be a massive improvement. It would slow drivers down, make them less reckless. Um, it's just a free for all highway through our neighborhoods right now. That's just completely dangerous. I've seen more accidents than I can count. I hear accidents from my house. Um, horrific things are happening on Venice Boulevard and it's just not a safe place. So, you know, maybe if this happens, I would become a biker. I've given it a go a couple of times down Venice Boulevard and it's just, you know, it's not safe for my kids. So I, we pack up all our bikes in the car and go somewhere else to ride our bike. So I'm totally for this. Dina? Uh, yes, hi, thank you. I'd like to mirror some of the comments that I've heard and express that I also strongly support this. And I thank you, Olga, for presenting it. I think you've done really a wonderful job. Um, I personally, even as a consumer, look for areas that are more pedestrian friendly and, um, and certainly to have an alternative mode of transportation to go by bicycles and to be, uh, to use, just to have a more clean environment. I think it actually promotes businesses. And I would say again, as a consumer, that, um, that not only do I look for areas like this that are more friendly to live in for, for everybody, um, but I would say that while we've experienced so many tragedies that had to do with this COVID uh, period, the one thing that I think is notable about this COVID period is that it's brought people outside from the indoors and it's, it's put cafes on the outside. It's made environments so much more friendly where people are actually engaging for one with one another. Um, I think to move cars a little further from the sidewalk and to have something like bicycles and to have a safer environment for both pedestrians and people visiting businesses, I think would promote the business environment. Environment. So I strongly, strongly support it. Thanks, Dina. Mary? Yeah, so I also strongly support it. And I'd like to throw something else into the mix. If we can get more people riding bicycles, all those TOCs that come to us with a half a parking space per unit will be much more attractive if people are actually, I know you don't like this, Charlie, but it's funny. But um, physically, the result of his death, Barry. Oh, hold on, Barry, go ahead, it's your turn. The fact is that uh, it offers an opportunity to have less car traffic uh, in the city of Los Angeles because safe bicycling will promote bicycling. I think that is undeniable. And I strongly support this whole uh, uh, Venice restructuring. Thanks. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm gonna share, uh, just, just for, for the sake of the argument. Um, as Crystal knows, I am very pro-car because we live in LA. Um, and I heard that guy, the, the guy who spoke about keeping things moving. With all that being said, Venice is nuts. Venice Boulevard is insane. I, 
as, as many of you who have been in this committee have known, I run, I run marathons. I ran with a group that's based on Venice Boulevard, Bechuva. A friend of mine worked there, joined their group, and ran as a community member with their group. We took runs from their location down Venice Boulevard. If I, if I have the opportunity and I run near my house, why well, run in the street as much as possible? Try to run in the street, preferably when it's not busy. I would not run off the street it, on, the, on the street on Venice Boulevard. It was the sidewalk only. There's no reason. That, that, that street is massively huge. There's plenty of room to keep things moving, move cars along, and still have room for bikers and walkers or, and or runners to be on the street. So while I'm pro car and think everybody's gonna drive around here and those TOC projects are still insane with their minimal parking, with all that being said, Venice Boulevard is, it's, it's massive. There's no reason why we can't try to encourage other modes of traffic, if for nothing else, to calm people down. I mean, about a year, maybe two, Chris can correct me. We had a discussion with, I think it was Palms Neighborhood Council about upping the speed limit on Venice Boulevard. And we were all very hesitant about that because it's already crazy enough and people fly down that street as it is. With that being said, um, while I would be the one who would probably vote no, given the fact that I like cars the most, uh, and I've made that very obvious in the past, um, I think this is a good idea. Uh, Jerry, you're up. I just wanna pepper in. I know a lot of folks have, have uh, commented some support. And Charlie, I agree with you. I'm, I'm pro car for the most part, but I, um, maybe six months ago or so, um, started biking back and forth to, uh, to my work uh, that's over in Mid-City, down Venice. And, uh, you know, not getting any younger or skinnier, so you gotta do something, right? Um, and, and even just last week, I actually had a pretty bad uh, spill right about Venice and La Brea that would have been prevented if there was something like this. I really truly believe that it's not, not fluff there. There was plenty of lane for both of us, me and this car that kind of cut me off, but it was because there was nothing designated. There was certainly nothing uh, to the left of me, you know, as any type of protection while I was in that lane. Um, so it, it was a little scary, quite frankly, uh, to have that happen. It was just a, a few days ago, about a week ago. Now I still have a nice size marker here on the side of me where I fell. So this is something that hits a uh, pretty home, even as someone who is in general pretty pro car for myself. This is, uh, I agree with a lot of what's been said about if the access was safer and it wasn't just about me, you know, cause I can't go to the gym. I, I think that there would be more reason for a lot of folks to use this type of, of transportation or even as pedestrians to, to get themselves from A to B using sidewalks or what it might be. So thank you. Thanks, Jared. Um, just guys, remember there are still a lot of items on the agenda. Um, we're already halfway there, but if you're just repeating, just repeat and or say, I agree. Um, everybody's got the right to talk as long as they want. I'm not going to cut you off. Uh, John, I see your hand, John Brandon, but I'll, you know, I will get to you. Um, John Lieberman, you're up. Uh, I, ha I have a concern about this, and it's not a big concern. I can live with the existing motion and letters it is written. But we did this project because someone saw a pile of money. And that pile of money came from the state to basically maintain Venice Boulevard as a street over the next 20, 30 years. I don't mind going into that pile of money and using it in part to make this a multimodal thing. I have no problem with that at all. But I do think we have to be realistic and recognize the fact that a lot of that street is taken up by cars and will continue to be taken up by cars even if we put in everything we are suggesting. The city has to have money to make basic repairs, and I'm not talking about street striping. I'm, I'm talking about basic repairs to the road in potholes or in cracks in the road. That needs to be taken care of whether you are a bike rider, you are a runner, or you are a car. So I would like to see the letter and the motion modified slightly to basically recognize the fact that some of that money has to go for repairs of basic, basic infrastructure. And what I'm suggesting is that we're in the motion that says to address these pressing concerns, the following items should be prioritized. And we have item two and three. I would put a new item one in there and drop the other items down to two, three, and four. And the new item one would say, bring the 
roadway into a state of good repair. And once the, and I don't mind spending all the rest of the money on the other items. Sorry, John, just to clarify, this project would be a full repaving of the road, including, including where cars are. Okay. Uh, Rich Balloon. I, I, I would like to respond to that for a second. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember what the amount of money is, but I don't think it was more than like 30, $50 million and a full repaving on the road goes over a million dollars a mile. Uh, so I, think it's, I, I doubt it would be a full repaving. No, it, it is that the, the way this project happened is this is a repaving, the ADAPT program is, this is a repaving that was already going to happen. And this is just an effort to add this stuff on top of that. So the, for this, like the road is still the priority to the city and state. The, the whole Venice for All project is just adding like, while we repave it, can we also add a bike lane and safer sidewalks basically? And I'm in agreement with all of that. All I'm saying is I would think our motion in the letter should recognize that the number one prioritization should be to bring the roadway into a state of good repair. Guys, okay, we're not going back and forth. We have other people that want to speak. Rich, you're up. Yeah, uh, quickly, I want to share uh, two things that haven't been said. I strongly support this motion. Uh, I have experience with similar restructuring in Long Beach, which uh, has been very successful. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, the more people you have uh, physically outside, especially in the evening, the lower the crime. That's been proven to be the case downtown. If you recall when the downtown revitalization occurred uh, and there was new building, uh, there was a rule that uh, any in condos lofts had to allow dogs. Why was that? Because when people have dogs, they walk outside at night. And one of the things that they had to combat was the crime, uh, which you know people knew about in the area. The way they helped to lower it was to get people outside, especially in the evening when they have dogs, they went outside and as a result, uh, crime was lowered. You had cafes uh, being set up, new businesses, uh, total re revitalization of the area. So uh, I, for those reasons, I think this is an excellent project. Uh, I look forward to uh, it occurring quickly and I support the motion. That's Rich. Terry Gomes. Thank you. Um... I think I'll, all the board members, I think I ride the most because during the summer, if I'm not working, I ride every day down to not only Venice Beach, but all the way down to Redondo and back. And maybe most of you don't realize there is a dedicated bike lane all the way down Venice Boulevard, all the way down to the beach. It's just uh, when you get to the Mar Vista area is where there's actually the bollards. And actually, when I ride, that's usually the most dangerous part. Two reasons why. One is that when you have pedestrians who are actually, they were drivers who are then running across to put money in the meter, they never look to look for a bicyclist. They just focus on that meter. And I've almost had collisions a few times with people who are actually running across and don't even realize that there's a bike lane there. Secondly, also is the fact that the signage that the city of Los Angeles has installed during that, in that area, Every other block almost seems like the signs are different. And there's been a few times when I've always been hit by a car because when you're in the bike lane, cars making right turns onto some of the side streets do not see you because if a car is parked there, they won't see you in the bike lane. And I've almost been hit a few times because of that. So they are there are inherent dangers in all designs. And the other thing I want to focus on, though, is actually the bus lane. Currently, if you look since 2000 with the Metro's ridership has gone down and down and down. And then it really hit to where from 2015 till now, it's really gone down on the bus ridership. It's gone down three to 6%, depending upon which line you're looking at for the trains. But on the bus ridership, it's gone down tremendously. And some people say it's because of AB60 where it's allowed undocumented neighbors to actually get driver's licenses. Yes, absolutely, Olga. 
they actually have gotten their driver's license. And Warner, I, I don't think we can make remarks like that about our undocumented population. You mean the fact that they got driver's licenses and now they're not taking uh, the bus? Causing, uh, acting like it's their fault. That I'm not saying it's their happened. fault. It's, it's what it is. They went from riding the bus to where they bought cars to be more mobile. That That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that it, it's a cause and effect that it's something they did wrong. It's actually great that they're able to get that American dream moving up with their cars, then buying houses. I think that's great. But the is bottom, there, sorry, where is this information coming from? Uh, from the Metro website. But the Metro website it, says undocumented people no, are getting cars. That, it's very rude that when I didn't interrupt you when you were talking, and now when it's something that I want to say, you're interrupting me the whole time. I'm asking you a well, clear. I waived my time. Thank you. Okay. One person speaking. It's uninterrupted time. If you have a question, you could ask it when the person's finished. So let's try to stick to remember we recommitted to the code of conduct and being cordial. John Tesler, you're up. I just wanted to throw my support behind it. Um, I think I can't think of a better streak than Dennis. Look at like a project like this. Um, I have. You know, I ride my bike five to 8,000 miles a year. I use Venice as a main co-corridor. Co it's amazing how many people use Venice now, even as it's unsafe as it is, as their main east-west um, corridor. And I think that uh, along with um, all the physical changes, I think there has to be an educational component to it also, uh, um, which I think would help uh, the car, car drivers that would use it um, to understand uh, the innate da dangers of even when you have protected bike, bike lanes, like making right-hand right turns and hooking people. That's it. Thank you. John Brand, did you still want to speak? Just set your hand up earlier. Go ahead, John I just wanted to respond to Terry's comment about uh, bus ridership going down. Uh, I know that Metro is looking at the possibility of making bus ridership free. And if that's the case, it would be a game changer in terms of the percentage of people who might be willing to consider riding a bus. Seeing no more, uh, oh, Terry, go ahead. Awesome. Uh, John, just like so you said that Metro Watts, who's going to pay for that? That's the other thing we have to look at, because right now, ridership is not supporting either the trains or the buses, and they're actually getting additional tax dollars to help with them. And also, with the improvements to the lines, it's been done through uh, ballot measures with increased taxes. So if they're going to go to a free bus or a free, they probably have to go to a free everything, not only the train, but also the buses. But who's going to pay for that? Terry, it's a brave new world. At some point, uh, people will vote on it. And democracy is democracy. There are winners and there are losers. Very good. All I'm, all I'm saying is your argument was that bus ridership is going down. I agreed with it. But I also said that it doesn't have to stay down. Aaron, your hands up, go ahead. Yeah, also a dedicated bus line will increase by uh, bus use because they won't be stuck in traffic and it will be a faster way to commute. So not only lower uh, prices, but a dedicated line will possibly increase bus ridership. And the truth is, is we really don't know the answer to any of those questions, but we can solve the problems that we can solve. And this is one that we can certainly be helpful in. Is your hand up again, or was that from before? Yeah, it was because I'm just saying, Barry's saying this about that it would increase and all that. Do you have any study that shows it does? Because Metro has the studies that shows that their ridership, even with increased uh, buses, with increased or with lower times of increasing trains, that their ridership is still going down. No, I don't. Oh, it was anecdotal. Okay. With that, I'd like to call the question. 
Ken? Yes. Crystal? Yes. Barry? Yes. Olga? Yes. Terry? No. I'm a yes. Rich? Yes. Uh, John Brand? Yes. Jared? Yes. Robbie? Yes. Mike? No. John Learman? Yes. Gloria? Yes. Dina? Yes. Steve? Yes. Gary? No. Chevy? Yes. Like I said, John, John Tesler, you're not eligible to vote in this vote, though I'm sure you would have voted yes, but I don't think it's going to matter. Yeah. Charlie, I hate hate to bring it up. We we need we never asked Crystal. Uh Crystal, are you up to date on the uh on the trainings? Because uh Empower LA website is not up to date. It was the only the funding one, right? That I lapsed on. No, no, the since then the other one lapsed also. The the ethics lapsed. Oh no. Yeah. Oh, crap. No, I'm not done. Okay. So we should unrecord. Your vote. I apologize. Strike that. Sorry. We will also be eligible to vote on the first one, unfortunately. Um, and we have still thirteen to, to three. Motion passes. Uh, I didn't. I didn't vote. Oh, sorry, Paul. I forgot you joined us. My my apologies. Um, I'm I'm a yes. Thank you. Thank you for correcting me and catching me. Let me just count this one more time. No worries. Fourteen to three, motion passes. The next motion on our agenda is a motion to support a proposed 15 unit TOC apartment building at 1059 South Holtz. Um, I believe that is the Vladimir and the other one. Vladimir and David, I promoted you to both to panelists. Great. Okay. Is there anybody anybody else here for your project, or is that just the two of you? Just the two of us. Perfect. All right. It's it's yours. If you if you need to share a screen, you are. Uh, David, are you? Yeah. Well, it's, it says host disabled participant I, screen I, I, sharing. I just fixed that. Go ahead. Okay. One second. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is David Feld. I am an architect in the um, Pico Robertson area. And uh, this is a project for 1059 South Holt Avenue. This is a TOC project. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to say um, thank you to all the board members. I myself am a member of an HPOZ board, and I know that it takes a lot of effort um, to be a part of this um, democracy. And uh, thank you for taking time to make it happen. I present, we presented this project um, on the 6th to the Land Use Committee. And so this will be a, a bit of a uh, review for some of you, but uh, we'll move through pretty quickly, a little bit quicker than we moved through the last time as per Charlie's request. Um, this is a 15 unit TOC project. We have two ELI, extremely low income units. Um, it replaces a single family dwelling. This is a, the TOC program is a program that was adopted into the municipal code and addresses the issues of housing scarcity, housing affordability, and helps the city move towards a smaller carbon footprint. The TOC program achieves this by allowing additional density and reduced parking for developments adjacent to public transportation. The proposed project is located close to both major bus lines and the proposed Metrolink Purple Line extension. Although the TOC project allows 16 units and six stories on this lot by right, the proposed project consists of 15 units and five stories in order to reduce the scale of the building and bring harmony to the neighborhood. The proposed project will reduce an existing, sorry, will replace an existing non-rent controlled single family dwelling. This was a point that was brought up in the previous meeting um, and I just wanted to repeat it here. The project would provide a net gain of 14 units <clears throat> in total and two extremely low income units where no rent controlled units existed before. 
A two bedroom ELI unit is currently slated to rent for approximately $500 a month, month for a family making about $33,000. Although per, C, per TOC guidelines, a project requires eight parking spaces, our proposal includes 11 spaces. Bicycle parking will also be provided as required by municipal code. The project is completely within the TOC by right zoning guidelines and is not requesting any variances. The project was discussed during the 10-6 land use committee, as I mentioned, and was approved, approved by a 7-0 vote. Thanks, David. Are there any technical questions from the board? I don't see any at the moment, so I will open it up to public comment. If you'd like to make a public comment, please raise your hand. If you're on the phone, press star nine. Okay. Uh, Bela, your mic is now live. Hi, I just wanted to say that um, I'm in support of having this uh, property being developed into a multi-unit uh, apartment building, especially for low income. And I know these two people personally, and they have uh, excellent reputations in their industry and as community members. So I would like to put my support behind this. Thanks, Bill. Seeing no more public comment, we will close the public comment period. I'm going to turn. Uh, go ahead. Um, would anybody like to move it forward? I'll move it. John? Do I have a second? Barry, I saw Barry raise his hand. And he is now nodding. So I have John and Barry. A second. Thank you, Barry. Do we need it on recording, unfortunately? Um, Gloria, your hand is up, go ahead. Um, I believe you mentioned that the low income unit will be priced at $500 a month. Um, did I hear that correctly? Uh, yes, yes, you did. This is per HUD uh, guidelines for extremely low income residents based on their scale and definition, I believe that Dovin may have included the HUD chart in the presentation today, though I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I just brought okay. it back up on screen if you'd like to see. There okay. Well, I do have a question. If it's 500, are there any legal requirements about the increase that will occur every year um, thereafter? I believe that my understanding of how this works is that it is those units are subject to the rent stabilization ordinance to RSO. So whatever the legal amount of increase is, whether it be 3%, 4%, I think the maximum in the city of Los Angeles is 5%. And I believe that we sign a 55 year covenant to keep those units as rent control units. So Pretty much, it's the life cycle of the building. Okay. Thank you. Just, just, to, be, just to be clear, uh, Gloria, they're, they're subject, it's, it's 500 some dollars right now. Obviously, by the time this building is completed, those numbers are different. The standard um, RSO increase is 4% right now. Um, mm -hmm. if, you pay, if you pay certain amounts of, of utilities, it can go up another percent, maybe even two of them are right wrong. I, 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 be I believe that 4% is an unusually high raise. It's standardly, I've owned, we've owned real estate in LA for many years and it's generally 3%. It went up to 4% about two years ago. They changed, they changed it until, until uh, June 30th actually. So, so it's already over. It'll increase or not depending upon what the city council votes on. Can't, you can't right right now. You can't increase via the uh, RSO. Correct. Right. Correct. Um, are there any other comments? Seeing none, let's uh, let's vote. Okay. 
uh, uh, Charlie, I just have one question because I must have missed it in the beginning. How many of the units are for, for extremely low and low income? I'm sorry, I missed that part. Two, 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 two out of 15? Correct. And what was current? what is currently there or was there? Single family dwelling with no rent control. Or right. occupied. Right. I, I, I happen to live there. So I know there's no rent control. I don't charge myself rent, at least so far. Um, all right, I believe there's no more questions, so let's vote. Uh, Ken? Yes. Crit, uh, Crystal's ineligible. Barry? Yes. Olga? Yes. Terry? Yes. Paula? Uh, yes. Hello? Uh, yes, yeah, I heard you, Paula, I got you. Uh, Rich? Yes. Uh, John, Brand, John Brand? Yes. Jared? Yes. Robbie? Yes. Mike? Yes. John Leeran? Yes. Gloria? Yes. Dina? Yes, nice project. Steve? Thanks. Yes. Gary? Yes. And Chevy? Yes. Seventeen zero zero. Motion passes. Thank you, gentlemen, for attending. I'm going to move you back to attendees. Next thing on our agenda is a motion to support an elder care facility at 843 to 847 South Sherborne Drive. Daniel, you've been promoted to a panelist. Is anybody else here with you or are you by yourself? I am by myself in terms of presentation. Go ahead. You can, you're welcome to share your screen if you so desire or share the project. The floor is yours. Uh, let's do this. You can see the trees, I'm assuming. All right. All right, thanks for having me. We are now entering the late portion of the evening, so I'm going to try to keep this as short as possible. I'll, I'll, I'll breeze through the parts that we talked about at the Land Use Committee meeting and then uh, focus a little bit more on the revisions that we made based on the outreach and the, uh, the feedback that we got at that hearing. Um, I do just wanna say though that I, I was moved by Amelia's comment earlier about focusing on the product. We've been tinkering with this project for about two years trying to make the best possible product and I hope that shows. Um, so this slide just shows a little bit of uh, context where we're at. You can see the, the, the purple circle around the, around the train station is, is the TOC tier three area which is what led us to shape the box that, that we designed here. This is just zooming in a little bit more on our surrounding neighborhood. This is the exact property. And I wanted to show a little bit of the height context. Uh, we know that this area is, is probably majority two-story buildings. And then as the years went on, we see four stories, five stories, and, and now TOC allows uh, for seven stories. So you can sort of see this progression every decade that a, a building boom happened. Um, you can see that we're in a transit rich neighborhood. I'm sure you guys know that very well. Here are some details about what the project is. We're looking at a 56 unit senior living facility, 48 for assisted living, eight for memory care. Um, and then just some details. I think what's, what's especially, what's a little bit different about this from, from most senior facilities uh, that I've worked on and that I'm sure that you guys have seen, this one is gonna have a kosher kitchen. And I think it's uh, especially strong to draw on that, on that rich history that, that we're in here, the rich Jewish history. Um, these are requested actions. We did remove one of the, one of the entitlement requests for a front yard reduction. So we've taken that out. Um, 
you know, we've, like I said, you know, we've really been focusing on the product. We've, we've made a lot of, um, we've put a lot of thought into a lot of different aspects of it. And I'll soon get into some of the changes that we did. But I think one of the most important things is that we have a, a, a trusted operator as our partner and they have other facilities. Uh, and, you know, every step along the way, we have them look at the plans and provide their feedback. And so we have something that we know is going to run well. This is what we uh, showed at the land use committee hearing. Okay. We sent the net notice out to, to neighbors within 500 feet. We had the hearing. Uh, we got feedback at the hearing. I've personally held several hours of phone calls with a number of neighbors. Um, there were some people that had a bunch of concerns that we've taken their feedback and other people that um, were, were calling to find out what was happening and, and ended up actually being supportive. Um, I'm probably going to get letters of that for the ZA hearing, but uh, just a little summary of that sort of outreach that we got. So these are some of the things that we've done since that hearing. And I want to jump into the, into the renderings and just kind of show them uh, other than just talk about them. So one of the things that we did was draw back the top floor even more. And we also changed the materials and the color of those of this top floor as well as as well as the, the seventh floor up there. There were issues about privacy. So what we did was you can see all of this. This is they call fritted glass, basically frosted glass. Um, so we added that on the bottom half of the layer of on the bottom half of the windows to increase the privacy. We did a voluntary traffic study. I'll, I'll, I'll show that a little bit later. Uh, the thing that was requesting, that was making a front yard reduction was this light well here. It was, it was much taller before. We reduced it and just got rid of that. We heard about some concerns about pedestrian safety. So we're putting in sort of like a mini traffic signal that, that gives pedestrians and cars a sense of, uh, you know, if another car is coming or not. So to be mindful of that. Um, and we've, we increased landscaping and um, and some other details that I'll get into later. But let's just get a look at what the building is. You know, we also we also did some different things. We heard that the building kind of looked like an office building, so we moved around the materials, the colors, and the windows to to make it look more residential in nature. Uh, this is the, the common dining area on the ground floor. Excuse me. We have the kitchen, the, the kosher kitchen. Um, we're looking here at the rear patio. This is going to be mainly for the memory care patients. We have the, the roof terrace, the, the not the roof terrace, the, the top floor terrace. And that's one of the things that's that we pushed back quite a bit. So you know we did a little bit of both. There's some open space and it's pushed back. Uh, and this is a this is a little bit of a close-up of what the entrance will look like and some views of it at night. <clears throat> I do wanna just emphasize that we have that it, we have 29 required stalls, but we're providing 40. And we're also doing that with the benefit of a valet attendant. Um, and also, you know, I think normal driveway clearance heights are less than 108 inches, but we designed this at 108 inches so that more service vehicles and you know just a more variety of vehicles can come inside we increased that to 113 inches based on the feedback that we got which will you know more different types of vehicles can can, can come inside uh, but we were able to do that without increasing the height of the building um, and we also did a voluntary traffic study to demonstrate i think a few times we used the word adt today uh, average daily trips. And this is just to show that a buy right TOC alternative would actually generate more traffic than the elder care, just because of the nature of an elder care facility of, of senior living. Um, so this just kind of brings us back to the project goals. And I know it's getting late. Um, and let's just focus it on, on questions and and uh, 
And yeah, thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Does anybody have a question? A technical question from the board? I'm seeing none. I will open up to public comment. If you'd like to speak, please raise your hands or if you're on the phone, press star nine. Seeing no comments, and I'm gonna turn off your screen sharing. Uh, would anybody like to move it forward? I'll move it. John? Second. Uh, Jared? Yes. Thank you. Board debate? Um, I, I know we've I know we've shared this this concept. So a couple of things. I know we shared this concept before about aging in place. I think more of these these places are good. Um, just to be clear, there were some people that did present some issues at the um, at the at our land use meeting. Um, I will tell you that not nearly as bad as some of the other ones I've seen, where people are much more up in arms than this one. I mean, I expect it with any TLC project or elder care or whatnot. I've seen it, but I think it's a good project. Uh, Terry, your hand is up. Yes, thank you. And this is to Daniel. Um, are your employees, are they gonna be union members like from SEIU um, and uh, earning a living wage? Because I know when I was working for the state that when you get into these types of facilities, most people were making minimum wage and didn't have benefits. So is this gonna be a, a union facility with uh, living wages or not? I actually don't, that's a, that's a good question. I don't have the answer to it. That would be something that I would ask of our operator. I, I know that these type of facilities, the majority of, and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, from, from my understanding of these projects, the majority of the staff here need to go through some sort of training that, that uh, I usually have a degree. Earning a living wage, though, and that's what I would like to know. And if uh, we don't know the answer, I would like to table this until we could get an answer back. Because it's very important that we're putting in all these facilities, but paying a minimum wage, they would have to come for miles to come to work because they couldn't live in our community without a living wage. So I'd like to make that motion. Is there a second? Hearing no second. Nobody cares about living wages. I'll second that. Hold on. I would like to ask a question of Terry regarding the living wage. We're not, we're not allowed to ask that question, John, at least not yet. Okay. I'm also, I'm Googling the, the group to see if they do, just because um, my mom is actually yeah, an employee. Yeah, I, well, well, I, well, I appreciate the extra comments, sorry. Um, tabling requires a vote first, and then it can be discussed, and if he wants to bring a motion again, by all means, go for it. Um, so this is a, mo mo a motion to table this project. I'm gonna vote, for, I'm gonna vote first. No, uh, Ken? I'm gonna vote yes. Crystal? Vote. Can you vote to table? I don't think we can vote on anything. Okay. Barry? No. Olga? No. Terry? Yes. Paula? No. Rich? No. John Brands? Yes. Jared? No. no. Robbie? No. Mike? Yes. John Lieberman? No. Gloria? Yes. Dina? No. Steve? No. Gary? No. no. And Chevy? Yes. Six yeses, 11 noes, motion table does not pass. 
Um, back to um, more debate on this motion. Uh, Olga, if you wanted to chime in on that one, I'll let you go first. You were gonna speak anyways. Yeah, I just wanna add that if that's something we wanna look into, I think we can ask with a little bit more specificity because it varies by profession. My mother works in these types of facilities and is union labor, um, but it, it really varies on what profession you're looking at. Like if you're looking at nurses, psychologists, like janitorial staff. So uh, some, some types of employees who work in these don't have any unions. So it really is going to vary. Uh, so for that reason, I don't know that that's necessarily something we could we could get a definitive answer on. Uh, As I, a union I person a myself. On Olga, if it's a union house, everybody's union. I'm a union member. So if it's a union yeah, thank house. You, thank you, Terry. Terry, I'm, I'm a union member as well. And uh, that's not the case for these types of homes. I know because my mother works in them. I worked in a, I worked in a state to state. So yes, they were all union. Okay. Um, so can you there? Dina, your hand is raised. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. My mother also worked um, actually in a retirement home for almost my entire childhood. Although, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the developer's project and I think that it's really critical to be able to allow developers to build um, because if we start to discuss their method of, of running their business, it will probably preclude them from being able to build their project. And the project is a benefit to the residents of the community. As we're sitting here today in our younger years, we will be also in our older years. And to think that we should you know, limit the ability for the elderly to have a, a care facility in their own area, I think is really us over governing um, and not thinking about the elderly who will need a place to live. And this is a beautiful project and I commend them for their efforts in building it. I hope that, that what they're going to be doing is being considerate of fair wages. Although I'm not going to implement my rule over that and preclude them from building their project. Mike? And I might have missed this, but Daniel, how many units are we replacing that are currently there? Uh, there's there's 12 units that are on the ground right now. If that's your question, there isn't a there isn't a replacement that's happening here. No, no, I'm saying what I'm saying is is that there's currently a building with a structure with 12 units. Um, and so it's a little bit nuanced. There, there is a 12 unit building there. It is it is vacant though. Okay, and is it under rent stabilization or no? uh it it was it was vacated uh i want to say about a, about a year and a half ago through, through okay the but it's still, it's still a a rent control it's still under rent control until it's demolished um well we did we did go through the rent we did go through the ellis act process and and so i mean i don't know if the tech technically whether it's no longer, I mean, I guess it's under rent control. I mean, that might be a very technical question that I, I would want to, you know, I, I would want to research further, but I mean, I, th I think we're getting, I'm trying to give you the facts that it was, it was Ellis about a year or two ago. Right, but either, uh, uh, for the purposes of my um, vote, I kind of look at whether or not there's a property that can be used or can be rented out uh, you know, currently on the books that we're taking off the market. So I kind of have to weigh that in my vote. That's why I asked. Gotcha. I, I think I answered your question though. Is that, John, is your hand up? Yeah. yeah. Da Daniel, what are, what are the rental units on these uh, projected to be? So you know, what, whatever market rate will be at that time, I think. Uh, uh, what, what would be the minimum based on what you've got penciled in to the cost? Um, I, I don't have those numbers, but, but what I found for most assisted living and memory care facilities that are, that are new product, which this would be around, 
um, for studios and whatnot, they're they're about like north of seventy five hundred or so. Okay, that that comports with with understanding too. And the reason I asked the question is Terry raised the question of whether the employees would be eligible to apply for these. And minimum wage, uh, minimum living wage, I think is fifteen dollars an hour. So do the math: fifteen dollars an hour over how many hours a week is not going to get you a $7,000 unit for a uh, assisted living? I, I don't think his question was whether the employees will be able to live there. I don't think that's allowed, actually. I, I think his question was whether they could afford to live there or afford to put someone in there. I think that was the basis of part of his question. I think the, you know, the basis of his, he, I think he was concerned about you know, putting in employees that are not going to be making enough money to live in the neighborhood and to kind of co further contribute to the issue of, of commute times and people coming out of our neighborhood, because you know, I live in Fairfax, coming out of our neighborhood and driving into where the jobs are. Okay. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Terrence, but, you know, Again, just to, 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 you know, I don't have the exact numbers about whether it's a living wage or not, but I do know the, the, the position listings. And so we have like, for example, in a, the, the, we have the executive marketing team, we have the, the director, there's the head chef, and then there are the sort of like, so those are like a little bit more of the, the higher tier um, employees that I think will, will definitely be making quote unquote living wage. Um, and then there's, and then it kind of goes down a tier to like the medical assistants that are, that are helping, you know, that are doing the majority of the assisted for the assisted living and, and sort of supervising the memory care patients. Um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and, and decide whether, you know, how much they're going to make and whether that's a living wage, but I do know that there's a range of, of incomes at these facilities that do require experience and education um, beyond that, what you would see at like, you know, like a, like a waiter or waitress or, you know, just something a little more non-skilled. Everything in here is some form of skilled work that I think will be able to support an income um, that, that we want to see. Uh, so I think that's just sort of my best shot at answering Terrence's question. But I mean, they wouldn't. They, the the employees certainly wouldn't be living there. I don't think that's. Well, I I don't think any of us had assumed they would be living there. I think the is, are we, are you guys doing the right thing by your employees? And I think based on what I've seen of your building, you probably are. And I just felt the question was an apples and oranges question. Yeah, and and you know that's that's one of the things why we chose an operator to bring onto our team up front. And when you look at some of the other facilities, you can go onto their website, the Parsons Group, and see the other facilities that they have in Ojai, in Santa Barbara, and there's uh, a bunch more in Texas. And um, I've, I, you know, I think the, the ownership actually went and checked out the one in Ojai, and they said it was immaculate. It was uh, very clean, it was very well operated. So. You know, again, I don't want to give information that I'm not 100% on, but judging on the operation and the operator that we have on board, um, I think they're going to, you know, for lack of a better word, run a clean operation and, and, and pay appropriate wages. Crystal, your hands up. I just wanted to express my full support of this project. Um, we've seen a few projects from Daniel and his teams over the last year or two. Um, and every time he's expressed his willingness to listen to neighbors, to take their consideration or take their concerns into consideration and make actual physical changes to the design um, to address concerns. So, I mean, that's exactly the kind of, you know, um, kind of relationship that we hope to have with developers who come to us. So I just, you know, I'm super grateful for that kind of um, approach to this process, um, as opposed to, you know, the folks who come to us and just, it is what it is, deal with it, that, you know, hasn't been Daniel's approach. So I just want to say that's fantastic. And aside from that, 
this project is still a wonderful project. Um, discounting the existing units, we're still net 40 plus additional units to the housing stock. So I'm totally for that. Seeing no more comments, uh, no more hands raised, let's vote. Ken? Ken? Uh, I'm going to abstain on this. Crystal? Still can't vote. Um, <laughs> you support it, but you can't vote. Got it. All right. Um, Barry? Yes. Olga? I wrote at the end. Sure. Terry? No. Paula? Yes. I'm a yes. Rich? Yes. John Brands? We lose John Brand. I think we did. We've lost him. Yep. Jerry? Yes. Robbie? Yes. Mike? No. John Lieberman? Yes. Gloria? Yes. Dina? Yes. Steve? Yes. Gary? Gary? I'm back to you. Chevy? Yes. Uh, Olga? Um, I don't think I can support a project that Ellis acted people in our neighborhood, so no. Gary? I don't know. Okay. No. Okay. Gary? No. Is that, that was no, Gary? Yes. No. <laughs> Join the millions of customers who have switched to Spectrum Mobile. Get connected today with data plans starting just fourteen dollars a day, all with no contracts. Go to SpectrumMobile.com. Use the Spectrum for a Sorry, Charge. Siri, please speak out. I can't hear you over the TV. Eleven four one motion passes. Thank you, Charlie. Sure. I caught that too. I was going to repeat it anyways. Um, thank, thank you, you all for your time. All right. All right. The next item on our agenda is a motion to write a letter of recognition for West LAPD Senior Lead Officers Community Relations. Um, this is a motion for public safety, so I will let Mike present it. Go ahead, Mike. All right. Thank you, Charlie. So this goes back to a motion that we originally had uh, started working on back at the very beginning of the pandemic. Uh, to recognize some really good work that the senior lead officers uh, have been doing in our neighborhood in Soro. Uh, unfortunately, by the time it came before the board, it was right after um, all of the, the protests at the end of May. And there was several board members who really felt that it should not be done at that point in time. And um, subsequently, we had a similar letter that we voted on, I believe in all, July, that was, uh, um, whatchamacallit, uh, uh, voted down, but uh, we didn't get to discuss it. Basically, it was at the very end of the meeting, and we did not have any time to discuss it at that point in time. Uh, it's now October, and basically, our guys, our senior lead officers, really could use some support right about now. And that all this letter does is recognize our slows in our area. That's it. It doesn't go beyond Soro. It doesn't address any other LAPD issues. Strictly our Soro slows. So I'm open to any questions. Are there any technical questions? Let's see any. Let's open up to public comment. If you'd like to make a public comment, please raise your hand. Or if you're on the phone, press star nine. I got a question. Oh, go ahead, Barry. Why at this time do they need the support? 
Uh, basically, in at several of our sorrow meetings, uh, they've been our slows specifically have been attacked by both board members and members of the public, and it left a very uh, bad taste in their mouths, um, so to speak. So it's it's really important that we repair the relationship with our slows so that they feel that they can come to the meeting and contribute to what we do as a sorrow NC. Um, and this would go a long way to repairing that. Gloria, your technical question, go ahead. Yes, so you mentioned that um, the police department was attacked by board members and the public. So could you provide a little context around that? Yeah, sure. There was um, at least one, uh, one and well, actually more than one member that uh, that would basically uh, constantly cut off uh, the the um, officers when they were giving reports. Uh, in addition to that, the members of the general public were literally threatening one of the slows to find them to dox them. And, uh, you know, one of them happens to be a very happy guy. He smiles a lot. And he was, uh, you know, basically admonished for smiling. I mean, there, there was a lot more. I mean, if you want to go back and look at some of the recordings, you'll see exactly what we're talking about. And it got to the point where now the officers do not feel comfortable coming not only to the NC meeting, but even public safety meeting uh because of all that okay so last week when or was it last month when we got these hateful uh individuals attending our call and yeah strangers sorry <laughs> attacking people like myself I, I, I personally don't see a need for anyone on the council to write me a letter of recognition. So I guess I'm still puzzled as to oh, why- No, I can answer that actually. I can answer needed. that. The, the recognition I, I, isn't because of that incident. I, I, I interpret, this is technical questions only guys, not for debate, but go ahead. You'd like to answer any technical- No, no, but it, it's answering her question from a technical standpoint is that this is not a response to uh, that partic those particular attacks. Uh, uh, it is more, uh, the timing of it is more to bring them back so they can feel a little bit more comfortable coming to the meetings, because right now the public does not have a chance to interact with the slows because they feel you know uncomfortable. So an overture from this, does help, but I must make clear the the letter itself does not address those attacks on the officers. Okay. Oh, you have a technical question? Just out of curiosity, uh, of these examples, which of these would be just standard cop part of the job stuff, and which of them are actually like a shining example for LAPD to follow, as as quoted? Oh, sure. No, I can answer that. Um, in general, I mean, pretty much all of them. In general, uh, every officer should do that, uh, hypothetically, uh, you know, as part of their duties to serve and protect and be part of the community. Uh, we've had several officers in the past who've done probably, you know, quarter of what these slows do or even less. Uh, one slow who was pretty much non-existent in answering any of these calls. So when you have slows that come in and do their job and do it well, that is what we're giving examples of. I mean, technically, we don't have to give any examples and just, you know, commend them. But, you know, we have that in the letter. But, uh, you know, just as, as some of the examples but they've gone way above and beyond. And mo all of these have come from the community, I should note. These have come from different uh, phone calls or uh, presented at meetings or by email to the uh, safety committee at some point uh, commending them. 
Any more technical questions? Point of order to extend the time trial. I guess I'll, I'll move to extend until 10 o'clock. Uh, I do have one more technical question. How many complaints have there been Charlie. against either Charlie. officer? Oh, Charlie. I moved to 10 o'clock. Is there a second? I seconded second. Charlie for you. I already did. Thank you, Terry. Any objections? No. All right. Thank you. Ola, your technical question again? Um, how many complaints have been filed against any of the officers on this list or the West LAPD in general during this time? I have no uh, record of any complaints on file against them. I don't see any more technical questions. I'm going to take public comment. Uh, Jay Soul, your mic is now live. Hello, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, you have two minutes. Thank you. A letter in support of and recognizing LAPD for their work at this time is an insult to my community. Recently, LAPD shot quote unquote non lethal rounds at folks that were celebrating a Lakers win, shattering someone's eye, ripping through lips and teeth. These are not actions that should be praised. People of color, especially Black people, experience violence at the hands of LAPD all the time. Many Black and Brown people of color that live in South Robertson do not feel safe around LAPD. I would like to see a letter from LAPD to the community recognizing that their violent acts are unjust and unacceptable. While you may be recognizing the few LAPD officers that patrol South Robertson, the message you are sending is that you only care about your own personal experience with LAPD officers and not the entire communities. Others that live in South Robertson have called into these meetings in the past and given their testimony about their negative and traumatic experience with LAPD in this neighborhood. These are real people. These are folks from our community. Please listen to the voices of the community, especially the voices that are often overlooked. Thank you for your time. Please vote to oppose this letter of recognition and also Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Thank you. Bela, your, your mic is now live. Thank you so much. Um, I want, Mike, I want to remind you, I think I'm the one that in January or December wanted to um, put this letter forward uh, in support of our two senior lead officers. Um, those two officers um, have done tremendous work in community relations. They have gone to the, they were, someone brought to the safety meeting about the fireworks. That year, they put together a flyer, they went to the schools, and miraculously, the 4th of July that year was really tolerable. It really was amazing, but the, the effect that they had in the community at the school. So while there may be, um, there, uh, there is validity to uh, police officers um, not behaving in a way that we want them to, and people are suffering from those consequences. But these two particular officers and the West LAPD in general in our community has been, they've been excellent in supporting our community and, and reaching out on a you know one-to-one -one basis. I was at a community CPAB meeting uh, last Wednesday, no, it was this Wednesday, um, and the, the um, chief of police of LAPD has come up with something that says eight cannot wait. They are working on this. It is something that they are addressing. The, um, the violence that you talk about that does happen in police departments against this, the community. Um, and I just think that it's important if you have people who are working hard to support your community as these two officers are, it's important to re recognize them and praise them. Thank you, over. Yeah. Seeing no more uh, public comments, I will close the public comment period. Would anybody like to move this forward? I move. Second. Second. All right, who was the first second? I heard a second. I just didn't know. Paula. Mike and Paula. Uh, 
Um, Steve, your hand is up. Thank you. Um, I know our slows. I've heard him speak. I've spoken with them. I've had exchanges with them. And uh, one can only go off uh, go off on, 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 on the actions of individuals. And it's my general belief that when you want to improve an environment, it's not enough to get rid of the bad elements, which we all know there are in the police department. It's important to empower and make an example of the good elements. And so I understand that there's a lot of frustration. I feel frustrated about the criminals that exist within the police department and we need to get rid of them. And the way to get rid of them, one of the ways to get rid of them is to make an example of the, of the upstanding individuals. And I believe we have two good slows. And I don't see why it wouldn't, why, I won't see how it would have a negative impact to recognize them, unless we believe that 100% of cops are bad, which I don't believe anybody on this board believes, then we should get rid of all of them. So I think it's good to, I think it's good to, uh, to, uh, to um, make an example of the, of the good individuals so that we should only have people like that. Thank you. Ken? Uh, yeah, I, I can only really talk about my own experience since joining the board. I didn't know any of the slows before I joined the board. Um, I got to know Mario initially, he used to come to all of our meetings. Um, I reached out to him a couple of times when people, stakeholders had asked me to get involved in, in, in different incidents that they were involved in. And as much as I, I found Mario to be a, a great guy, but he was unresponsive uh, in every case where I, I reached out to him personally. Um, I would say uh, since getting to know uh, uh, Chris, uh, Chris Baker, especially uh, more so even than Matt, Matt's, Matt's a good guy, but I, my experience with Chris has been extraordinary. And um, uh, I mean, the one that the, the case that just comes to my mind immediately was when a, a good friend of mine who happens to be African-American, uh, he's tall, tall guy, he's about six foot four. And um, uh, he was actually attacked by a guy in the neighborhood uh, and uh, happened to be a white guy, attacked him. And um, in the process of filing reports and following up on the incident, uh, he initially talked to whoever the, the officer assigned by the uh, uh, precinct was. And, uh, and to follow up, I said, hey, let's call Chris Baker. Oh, you got to put the, those ice things in the, in the uh, Oh, so anyway, uh, Chris uh, was astounding. He knew the, of the incident, even though he had not been the officer involved in the incident. He, he seemed to know everything that was going on in the neighborhood. Uh, he was on top of it. He was helpful. Uh, he helped with every aspect of the situation uh, until it was finally resolved. And... Um, uh, I, I, I'm, that's just one case. I've, I've been involved with him with several cases. My experience is that he's been extraordinary. Um, and, and I agree with what Steve said, you know, when somebody does that, uh, especially when, um, they go above uh, and beyond to act responsibly at a time when a lot of their coworkers or some of their coworkers are not acting responsibly. I think you have to, uh, to acknowledge that. I mean, it's, it's kind of back in, in the day when, when uh, I was learning to be a, a manager in business, we, the popular book at the time was one minute manager and, you know, one minute manager is basically when somebody does something good, you reward them. And when somebody does something bad, you, uh, you know, you, you unreward them um, or punish them as whatever the case may be in a, in a given situation. Uh, this is my experience with these guys is that they deserve the pat on the back and, and I fear what would happen if we lost them. Um, that's what I most worry about with, uh, with these uh, slows. Uh, well, we've lost Matt already. Uh, we have uh, uh, Chris Ragsdale, I don't know him. Um, Chris, uh, I, I've 
I've seen him drive by recently. I don't know if he's at risk of leaving the area. I hope he doesn't. He's, he's a real asset and he's an asset for, uh, uh, for people in, you know, in, in the Jewish community, in, in the black community, uh, my experience with him. And um, I haven't seen him in a, you know, a whole spectrum of cases, but I've seen enough cases where he's been an asset in every case that I've, uh, um, that I've seen him. So I, I'm fully supportive of, uh, of, of giving the pat on the back uh, when it's warranted and, uh, and giving the, uh, um, uh, you know, the rebuke when it's warranted and it's not warranted here. What's warranted here is the pat on the back. Gloria? Yes, so two things. Um, I agree with Steve to a certain extent that generally it's important that when you're in an environment where you have people who do their jobs badly, you should always focus on recognizing the people who do their jobs well. However, one issue that we've seen over and over again, the reason why we have bad cops specifically is because the good ones stand by and allow the bad ones to do what they're doing, right? To, um, to beat up on people of color, disrespect and dehumanize people of color. This is one of the reasons why the bad cops do what they do because the so-called good ones are just standing by and are allowing them the license to do these things. The second thing I would like to mention is Olga earlier mentioned that what specifically in the list of examples provided are not considered standard. And as I read through the examples that are provided on the list, I really don't see anything that is so phenomenal that would require a letter of recognition. For example, slow Chris Baker meeting with Rainier Park neighbors to address various problems. This is what you should do as a police officer if you're getting paid or slow Matt Kirk meeting with Crestview neighbors in an effort to reduce home burglaries and theft. That's part of the contract they sign in order to get a paycheck on a daily basis. I really do not see anything on the list here, item after item, that warrants an individual who goes out of his or her way in order to do something exemplary. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Paula? Uh, yeah, I, you know, this is a difficult issue and um, there's a lot of perspectives to consider. So I wanna thank all of you who have commented so far and added to the board debate. Um, my personal opinion is complicated also. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we're, we're in a moment where we are scrutinizing the police departments across the nation and that this is something that's been overdue. And while I agree with Gloria that, you know, there are good cops that stand aside, I think that we also have to um, you know, when you're in a really bad environment and um, you're doing your job, that is kind of going above and beyond um, because most people would just quit. Um, so, you know, when I hear that and, and also, you know, I've been looking at this from my perspective as a tenants activist and this is, you know, hotly debated in the tenants union right now. And it's been very divisive, I would say. Uh, you know, there are people who are legitimately afraid of the police and they don't wanna deal with them. And I would not put anyone in the position of having to do that. But at the same time, when we have things going on like illegal lockouts where landlords are locking 
tenants illegally out of their homes during a pandemic and they don't have a writ from the sheriff's department, um, calling the police is something that can make sense for somebody, you know, considering if that's what the tenant wants to do and then we have to support them. And if we don't have a good relationship with the police, it's gonna be harder to know who we can call upon. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a sort of a game of chess and uh, I've been looking a lot at uh, restorative justice and transformative justice from an abolitionist, prison ab abolitionist perspective. And it does seem that the main thing is community building. That's how we create safety as a community. Um, and so we, we need to look at how to uphold our standards as a community by um, promoting good behaviors and, and um, you know, disincentivizing bad behaviors instead of just blaming wholesale, um, you know, service workers and blaming an entire profession. Uh, that's my view at this point. So, um, and I, I'm, you know, it's continuing to evolve. So thank you all for listening. John? I, I'm kind of conf conflicted by this whole motion. Uh, first of all, let me say, I think our two slows are good slows. I have no doubt about that. But if I go and look at the bullet points on the letter of recognition, all they are, I, in my view, and I think uh, Olga and Gloria have it right, are what their job should be. And the reason the letter is being written is that our two slows were beat up a little bit by some of our stakeholders and maybe one or two of our board members at a public safety meeting and maybe a board meeting. Uh, if that's the case, I think a letter of an apology might be appropriate. But I, I have problems saying to the chief of the West LA department, here are two guys who are exactly because they're doing their job. If we, we could show by bullet points where they're doing above and beyond what their job calls for, yeah. But just doing their job, no. And the other part of it that kind of bothers me is the letters being written according to Mike because he's afraid that our slows are not gonna show up. Well, showing up where you may not be wanted as a police officer, is part of the job. And if that's the only reason we're writing the letter, we shouldn't be writing it. So I, I've got a real conflict on this one and I'm not quite sure at the moment how I'm gonna vote. I'm gonna make one, one quick point. Um, when we look at, at, at police officers, I look at them the same way I kind of look at referees in sporting events. If you're talking about them, they're doing a really crappy job. Nobody talks about a cop when they're doing a good job. And we talked about a ref and they're doing a good job. You talk about them and they do a crappy job. So if there are things, so while, while I understand your point there, John, and I'm not, this is not on the motion, so to speak, but to say that they're doing their job, so we can't, we can congratulate them for doing their job. I mean, unfortunately, the guys that did their job too, just did it the wrong way. So doing your job the right way is exactly what we're, what we're, we're thinking them. For. I mean, it's something the motion saying, that's what we're thinking them for. And that just, a point there. Olga, you're up. Um, I just want to say that this is one of the most tone deaf public meetings I have ever been part of. The fact that there is a group of white people here trying to completely disregard every comment against this letter that we've gotten from people of color and excusing it by saying you have black friends, for example is absolutely appalling. And if the amount of media attention Soro got for the boulders incident was bad, I cannot stress with everybody watching us right now, how much flack we would get for doing this. Like it is, it is shocking to me that after everything that has happened this year, this board would even consider 
thanking police officers who, by the way, I've gotten more vitriol in these public meetings than the either of them have gotten during that one public safety meeting where they were asked to follow the law. The people calling in were calling because the people who did the boulders broke the law and didn't get in trouble. The police, it is their job to enforce these laws and the entire complaint that has been going on this whole year, much longer, decades, is that they enforce that law selectively. When we act blindly, like, like, oh, they're just cops, they protect us. It shows me how clouded our perspectives are as wealthy white people who live in a wealthy white neighborhood. That's just a fact. Anybody can try to act like we aren't, but that's what this board is. This board does not represent the makeup of this neighborhood. Uh, a lot of this neighborhood is people of color. And putting forth this letter right now, especially right now, I literally cannot imagine doing something that was more actively trying to bring bad will to this neighborhood council. It, like it, it's impossible. And I know a lot of people here think I'm biased because I actually I do believe all cops are bad. But the, the way we talk about how they're here to keep us safe just isn't true. Those cops laughed at us when we referred to our unhoused friend, Mateo, who was chased out of his neighborhood by the people who installed the boulders, a person of color, by the way. They literally laughed at us. They're not guys who smile. They were scoffing at us. Why would we support that? Why would we try to excuse that? Secondly, I just don't, I mean, that's not really the second thing I'm saying. That's a lot of things I'm saying, but like, lastly, I just don't understand what the motivation is to thank them for again doing their job because they're not overtly racist. The idea that the West LAPD has not had any complaints filed against them, by the way, is an incredible assertion. I would love to see documentation backing that up. Uh, but for now, anybody who votes in support of this, I promise you it's not going to go well with the public. Like even, even the most conservative people in this neighborhood know that this is bad for the image of this neighborhood council. I can tell you that. Like supporting this letter, I cannot think of anything that would garner more ill will with the people of color who live here. And that's it, thank you. Dina? Yes. Well said, so, Olga. Thank you. So first, um, I definitely heard what Gloria said about the possibility of a good cop standing by and allowing bad cops to do harm onto others. However, a good cop who stands by and allows a bad cop to do harm onto others is not a good cop. They are bad cops. And um, when we say that a cop doing his job does not deserve recognition, I, I think that we all forget that the job of a police officer is not picnicking in the park. The job of a police officer generally puts his life at risk every single day. So if he's doing his job and doing good onto a community by keeping a community safe, and certainly not harming others because that goes without saying, you can't say that a person, a firefighter, a police officer, an emergency room worker uh, does not deserve recognition for doing their job because their jobs are not casual jobs. They are difficult jobs and they've taken it upon themselves particular dangers upon themselves um, and the potential of not returning home to their families. So it's not a typical office job. And yes, when they are doing their job, that is absolutely a good thing. But so far as my personal experience, it was only last week that I was walking in the Santa Monica neighborhood outside of our Soro neighborhood. And there was an African-American woman who was screaming because another man had attacked her and she was screaming to call the police. Now, what would have happened if we couldn't call, if we couldn't, I called 911 myself. There was a man swinging a metal rod of sorts who was completely out of control and she was terrified and she was screaming in the streets for someone to call the police. 
So I did on my phone and I called 911. And I have a particularly long um, experience in the Soro neighborhood in the um, Robertson La Cienega Cadillac area. And um, many, many African American people who are long time uh, residents in in the area do not share that thought that all police are bad. And in fact, call upon police themselves when they need the help. And the idea to simply point your finger at every single cop, because there have been some that are noteworthy of being despicable and doing the most horrific things. But to then cast that shadow upon every single other officer who will answer the call when our friends in our neighborhoods call call for their help is also not the right tone. And it's important to differentiate those who are doing good and risking their lives to protect the lives of those who are innocent and who call upon them for help and, and distinguish them from those who are not is really the wrong call. What it is, is it becomes mass hysteria where you have to um, pander to anybody who you're afraid of for speaking up. So I disagree there. I agree in every area of Black Lives Matter, matter and people of color's lives matter and, and all those who have been perhaps um, treated differently, but that doesn't mean that the handful that are doing great jobs and are of good service to a community do not deserve the recognition. And I agree with John as well, not only do they deserve the recognition, but we probably owe them a letter of an apology as well. Thank you. Pardon me, Charlie, but I move to we extend for another 30 minutes. I'll, I'll second. Anybody opposed? And 30 days. Rich, you're up. Yeah, uh, I, I think we all need to listen to each other and consider the important points that we're all bringing to the table. Um, you know, this issue has been lingering for some time. Uh, opinions are strong, people can become heated. But I think there's legitimate points on both sides and so we need to really be aware of that. Um, I've heard from and spoken to several people about this matter. I've attended several committee meetings, the Public Safety Committee, meetings, the executive committee meeting that a few weeks ago, of course, these thorough and And it's clear to me that we need to be mindful of two things. One, we need to be aware of people's individual pain experiences, of their individual pain experiences with law enforcement in some cases. Not in all cases, but in some cases. And what's brought this or the recent events that have received national attention, which have received, which have revealed some very, very troubling incidents. Now, now, having said that, as a member of the Public Safety Committee since I joined the NC, I've witnessed the very positive interactions between the SLOs in the Public Safety Committee and how extremely responsive they've been to the neighborhood concerns, including my own. And in my view, Already, they have always stepped up late. Uh, I addressed with uh, Chris not too long ago, uh, a couple uh, who were outside of Starbucks, and some of the people might were complaining that they were harassing them as they walked by. He was already aware of it and told me what he was doing to address the problem. Uh, this list I think in some ways demonstrates that they do go above and beyond their duties. Now, we've all experienced some people who, you know, do the bare minimum uh, and they get by and uh, they are able to continue in their job, but then really not stepping up to the plate. These SLOs based on this extensive list clearly have stepped up to the plate, always walking the beat. The, I mean, they've assisted synagogues with, re with regard to terrorism concerns. Uh, they've uh, attended the neighborhood watch meetings until recently. They've been regularly attending the public safety committee meetings uh, regularly, always. And there aren't any cases, any incidents with these particular uh, SLOs where they haven't 
come to the fore where they haven't done what they are supposed to do, yes, but collectively, when you view it in totality, they've gone above and beyond what so many others do without any examples with regard to these individual SLOs of any problems. And again, this isn't uh, uh, disregarding the very serious problems that exist with regard to certain police officers. So I personally support this letter of praise recognizing the, uh, these SLOs, but I think given the circumstances, and again, we need to listen to each other and just reflect back on how many meetings we've had about this issue and how heated the discussions have become, we need to recognize the significant pain which law enforcement, which people have experienced with regard to law enforcement. And I think what I'd like to do is offer a friendly amendment to this letter, to the motion. And what I propose is that we include a preface to the letter recognizing the need to address the current circumstances while also uh, uh, stating our appreciation for the service that these SLOs have offered to our community. And what I propose is adding to the letter the following. While the Soro MC recognizes that recent events in the national news necessitate the immediate correction of problems in law enforcement, wherever they may exist, and we unequivocally condemn any and all uses of force in violation of the rights of any members of a community, we also want to recognize, and then the letter will flow. And I think that change will allow us to demonstrate that we're aware of the experiences that people have had with some, not these, but some members of law enforcement while recognizing with, with regard to these SLOs, the very positive work that they've done. So I make that friendly amendment to the uh, motion by adding this uh, language to the letter. Um, if I can interject, um, I don't think we can actually do that as a friendly amendment. I think that would be an actual amendment if I'm not mistaken. I second Richard's amendment. Okay, I wanna be friendly, but if, it, if you wanna characterize it as actual, that's fine. I make an actual amendment to the letter by adding this language. Um, I'm gonna speak on this one. Look, I, supporting the police right now is not the point. And I know what I said earlier about that we're, we're recognizing people for, for when they're not doing anything. Chris Baker is an amazing person. He has done above and beyond what I would ever have asked of him, even as a police officer. With that being said, there's one thing that Olga and I, what well, we may have different opinions on the police, uh, agree on. This seems tone deaf. Like right now, it's just tone deaf. By all means, we should thank them. Above and beyond, they do a great job. Our SLOs do a great job. It's just the timing. If this was in January or February, by all means, like we should have been thanking them a, a lot. And I will go out of my way personally to reach out. I mean, what, what Rich said earlier about the terrorist threats, I've seen uh, Officer Baker walk, walk Pico Boulevard on a Saturday morning, synagogue to synagogue, to make sure everybody's calm. When there were, when there were riots approaching, they went around the area to inform people. Now you may say that's, that's their job, but it's not. It's not their, their job is to protect. Their job was not really listening. These are people that don't otherwise have phones, but they did a job to make sure everybody was safe. That's not the point. The point right now is this, this timing. It's, it's a timing issue. This is, this is the, the motion is good. I will, I will abstain from this vote. Because I'm not going to vote no to not to, to not write a letter of support to them because that to me is wrong. But I can't vote yes. I can't vote yes to, to a letter because the timing, especially with all the other crap that we just had going on, with with the Boulder situation and 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 the storm of crap that we had thrown our way. I, I, I just I want to support this, but I just I just can't. And not not right now. I, it pains me to say that. Crystal, you're up. Charlie, can I just interject? I'm sorry, but I made a motion. I believe it was seconded. And where does that? And we, are, we are now debating that. We'll have a vote on the on the on the motion. It's a, we'll have a, a vote on your amendment, 
and then we'll vote on the motion. So I can just add my yeah. comment as it relates to the motion as a whole as amended because I think it's kind of my comments will be the same either way. Um, I agree this is completely tone deaf. Um, I would say that if you know members of the public or members of this uh, board want to say thank you to our senior lead officers, by all means, like send them an email, send them whatever, you know, thanks up and down, that's fine. Um, but right now, as a board, for us to issue this letter, I think is just completely inappropriate and unnecessary. I also want to kind of bounce off of a little bit what Paula was saying earlier, in that, you know, it is important to point out members of our community who are doing the good things to try to encourage those good things to continue happening. Um, I think instead of thanking our you know, police officers for doing their job, essentially, we should write letters to these Rainier Park or Crestview neighbors who are going above and beyond to make their neighborhood safer, right? Who are these people that are doing something above and beyond what you know, their job requires of them? I think that's something to recognize as a board. Um, I would challenge everyone on this board to kind of recognize that, you know, at, at least from my perspective, like I can recognize that my interactions with the police, my perception of our slows based on my interactions with them is pretty irrelevant to this conversation that we're having nationally, right? Like, yeah, they're great people. My interactions with them are fantastic. That's not what this is about. So that's it. Steve? Um, Charlie, uh, and by the way, uh, Crystal, I definitely agree with what you said in terms of recognizing uh, citizens and neighbors who, who work hard and make every effort to make the neighborhood safe is, is definitely something that's, that's, that's honorable. And um, Charlie, I mean, I agree with you that it's, you know, that it could be, it could be perceived as, as tone deaf and I get that. And if I'm gonna vote yes to this, it, I'm certainly not looking to hurt anybody's feelings. Uh, and I think that uh, Michael brought this, this forward because what I was at those meetings and saw how those slows were addressed. They were thrown in like they were in the same bag as the criminals, as their colleague criminals. And so, Yes, there needs to be a little rectification, and that's and that's why I intend to vote yes. If we if we if they hadn't been spoken to the way they had been spoken to, I would say that it's not called for. I agree, people do their jobs, and you know they do a good job, and that's great. And maybe at another time, because it could be perceived as why are we doing this now? And I get that, but as a board, uh, those those officers came, they were shamed for 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 no reason. There's a guy believing, you know. It's personal accountability. So it's because of what happened that, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, that Michael came up with this idea. I don't think, I wouldn't have voted yes if, we, if Michael just came up and said, you know, I think we should, we should write a letter of appreciation to our, to our slows. I would say why and why not? But there's, there's a precedent here. By the way, the letter was written before that meeting ever happened? Not as I heard it. I, I go back to something I said a few minutes ago. We had the slows come to a meeting. The slows were not treated appropriately. And I think there is some rectification that is needed by this board. But I don't think the action that is called for is to praise them for something they should be doing anyway. I think the action called for is to apologize for the fact that they were badly treated. Fine. And I don't think that is a tone deaf response. I agree with John. I think at minimum we have to apologize and perhaps recognize the fact that they're, they're here for us because those two are here for us. For us, meaning the neighborhood at large. Mike? So who's apologizing? Wait a minute. I got you guys to raise the hand, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so. Gloria, go ahead, Mike. Why would I, why would I apologize to? Gloria, Gloria, Gloria hold on. Mike, Mike was up. I, you, I will okay. call. Thank you. Michael. Okay, so I wanted to address both um, 
you know, what John and Steve had just said. Um, well, specifically, first of all, even though we had initiated wanting to recognize them going way back, going into January, yeah, no, this letter was not formed until July. So that's the first thing. Secondly, is that it wasn't just one meeting where they were being raked. It goes back several meetings. So um, I just want to put that out there that it was it was over a period of time. And I just kind of want to put it into perspective uh, to anybody who is, you know, uh, has a family, either has a lot of brothers and sisters or a lot of children. If you have a bunch of children and some of them are getting C's, some are getting B's B and D's, but, and one of them is getting an A, and you want to praise that child for getting an A, why do you not, you know, praise them uh, be just because other children are not, you know, are hurting as well or, or need the extra help? Yeah, you need to help them. You need to recognize where they're at, but you don't hold it against the person who went out or the kid who went out and got all those A's. You recognize them, you praise them, you take them out, whatever it is. And in the same way, there's no reason not to praise these senior lead officers. Okay, uh, they've gone way above and beyond comparatively. The previous slows uh, have been C's, quite honestly. Some of them D's, but these guys are A's. And I want to address Olga, you brought up race and it really shouldn't have been an issue in this discussion, but since you did make it one, uh, I will point out that one of the officers in question is African-American. So I just want to put that out there that these slows not only reflect the community in their ethnic makeup, uh, you know, one of them is a person of color as well, or actually two. Sorry, uh, at what point did I question the race of any of the- uh, You were talking about said, uh, toned up to yes, the community. And yes, I said this it. is the board of all white people voting on a major issue of systemic racism. If you wanna act like race is not part of this, please let the record show that I was the one who brought that up. Thank you. And Michael, please do not insult people of color even further by saying- I'm insult. Can I complete my sentence, please? I'm asking I, how I insulted. Well, will you allow me to complete my sentence? Absolutely. I said, please do not insult people of color even further by incorporating the fact that because one of the police officers is a person of color, this letter is appropriate. Don't do that, okay? It's highly inappropriate and it's highly insultive to do that. I'm sorry so if you felt that was the inappropriate and why you'd like it was to not intended to be inappropriate or insulting to you. Okay, thank you. And I'd also like to add to the individuals who, maybe it was John, you made a suggestion that it should possibly be an apology. I think a letter of apology is even worse than a letter of recognition. It's humiliating. You could not stab a person of color any worse by submitting a letter of apology to the police. Right, um, without seeing any further comment, let's first vote on the amendment. See that passes. Ken? Oh, sorry. I'm going to jump up and say ask me to call later. Uh, on, on Rich's amendment? Yes. On okay, Rich's amendment. Rich's amendment, yes. First of all, got kicked off soon. Uh, Barry? Oh. Olga? No. Terry? Yes. Paula? Yes. I'm going to abstain. Rich? Yes. John? Uh, John Bram, he's gone, sorry. Uh, Jared? No. 
Robbie? No. Mike? Yes. John Lieberman? No. Gloria? No. Nina? I'm going to abstain. Steve? Yes. Gary? Yes. Chevy? We lose Chevy. We lost Chevy. All right, I believe that did not pass. One, two, three, four, six, seven yeses. Stand corrected. Seven yeses, six noes, the, the amendment passes. Now we'll vote on the motion, the uh, motion as amended. Ken? I'll come back. Yes. Barry? Oh. Olga? Can we, Charlie, sorry to interrupt the vote call. Could we get the, could we get the language now that well, this is the new letter one more time before we vote for it? That's fine. Rich, can you repeat your language again? I was going to pull it off from a sure. sure. The letter would begin, while the Sorrow NC recognizes that recent events in the national news necessitate the immediate correction of problems in law enforcement, wherever they may exist, and we unequivocally condemn any and all uses of force in violation of the rights of any members of a community, we also want to recognize, and then it would go on uh, to the uh, recognition of the close. Let's take over that off. Olga? Absolutely not. Terry? Yes. Paula? Yes. Stand again. Rich? Yes. Jared? No way. Robbie? No. Mike? Yes. John? No way. Gloria? No. Dina? I'm going to abstain. Steve? Yes. Gary? Yes. Chevy's gone. Seven yeses, six noes. The motion passes. One second, just up to in my minutes. The next motion on our agenda is a motion to fund several business cards for by up to eight hundred dollars. I'll present this one um, for Ken if you don't mind. Essentially, we have new more board members who need business cards who have not had business cards ordered for them, and we need money to order. Are there any technical questions? Is there any public comment? If you'd like to make a public comment, please raise your hands or press star nine if you're on the phone. Bailiff, go ahead. Hi, thanks. I have a question about the business cards. Only, I mean, I, I'm all for business cards. I love business cards. I have every business card that I've ever had printed since I was 16 and I'm now 60, almost 64. Um, but since we are in this COVID uh, situation, I'm sorry if that was funny. Um, since we are in COVID, where are we handing out business cards? That's no. my question. I know you can't answer because it's, well, it's well, a public comment. Yeah. Over. I don't think there's any more public comment. Um, to answer that question, essentially, we don't think it's going to be going on forever. There are meetings that people go to at some point in, down, down the line. Um, everybody who's on the board has them. And we, we approve them in our budget. It's just a matter of once they get a chance to use them again or keep them for all that matters. I don't think I've given one out, or maybe I have made a few. Um, would anybody like to move this one forward? Charlie, I'll move it forward. Olga, and is there a second? I'll second. second. Oh, Mike, I'll give it to you. Michael, second. Is there any deb more debate? Seeing none, let's vote. Ken? Yes. 
Chris, uh, Crystal's gone. Uh, Barry? I didn't care. Sorry, Barry, you got cut off. Yes. Thank you. Olga? Yes. Terry? You said Terry, right? I did, yes. Okay, because it's hard to tell what she said. Because I still see Gary there, but I never hear him speak. Um, uh, one quick question. We're getting these from G uh, GSD, correct? You'll have to. Yes. 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 Yes, yes then. Uh, yes. Rich? Yes. Jared? Yes. Robbie? Yes. Mike? Yes. John? Yes. Gloria? Yes. Dina? No. Steve? If they're delivered with a box of gloves, yes. If they're not, it's, are you still a yes? Still a yes. Gary? Yes. Motion passes. 1410. I've got it 1310. I have it at 1410. Hmm. 14, 1410. And there are 15 people here, so it has to be 13 1 because Jonathan can't vote. Oh, well. Can I add somebody? May I put a vote down that didn't? Correct. Um, Paula was here when I started this vote. Oh, okay. But yeah. I, I, I didn't have her as voting. Did you have her as voting, Charlie? I thought I had her zoning. Did you not see her? No, that's that's the one that I don't show. Thirteen one zero. I'll double check the video later. Regardless, it passes. Um, motion to adopt the standing rule on submission of motion for board motions for board consideration. Um, John, you want to present this one quickly? We only have seven minutes, and there's still yeah. Time. Basically, we just wanted to make sure that anyone who was voting on a motion or a CIS knew what they were voting on. And uh, it would make it easier in case anyone wanted to change the motion later on. Uh, we at least have a, a starting point as a template. You mean that the, that the CIS has to be, the, the letter has to be included? Well, dra the draft either the CIS or the letter has to be included. Um, any, any technical questions? Any public comment? I don't see any. Um, would anybody like to move this forward? I'll move it. I'll Put move my it. hand up, Charlie. You have a technical question, Terry, or board yeah. debate? Well, it's kind of a technical question, though, because the city attorney has already uh, gave a determination letter that anything a board votes on, the letter must already be there. So I don't understand why we're reinventing what's already a rule. Because we haven't been following it, Terry. Well, then that's the executive board's problem that they shouldn't allow it to even go on the agenda then, John. Terry, well, what are you trying to correct? John, hold on. Terry, when you get a chance, I'm still going to I'm still gonna let this motion move forward. If you could send that to me, and then I have even better rights for that. Sure. Um, I can't speak to what Martin previously did. If you'll notice that everything that was on this agenda, personally speaking, I made sure I had a letter attached to it. You're right. But yeah, it, that's the way it's supposed to be, because anything the board votes on, it has to be there for transparency and for the public to see. All right. I, I had John moved. Was there a second? I'll uh, second it. Um, given that Terry says that there's an already a rule that says this. Uh, a law in place that says this. I would consider tabling this for a month so I can get the, the facts on it and vote on it next month. So as such, I'm gonna move to table on that basis. I'll second that. We're gonna vote on the tabling of this motion. Of course it does, it goes on the top of next month's agenda. Ken? Yes. Uh, Barry? Yes. Uh, Olga? Yes. Terry? Yes. 
Paul is gone. Uh, I'm a yes. Rich? Yes. Jared? Yes. Robbie? Yes. Yeah. Mike? Yes. John Lingren? Yes. Gloria? Yes. Dina? Yes. Steve? Motion to table? Yes. Motion yes. To table. Thank you. Gary? Oh, I lost Gary. Uh, and Chevy's gone as well. Oh, John's not going to 13 0 0 table. Um, before we finish, general public comment. This is for anything not on the agenda. I know you're all going to laugh. I have two members of the, of the public. Would I would like to speak on general public comment. If so, please raise your hands. Seeing no one there, uh, I move to adjourn this meeting at 10.27 PM. Do I have a second? A second. second. Thank you. Uh, any objections? Robbie has a stand up though. Yeah, Charlie, sorry. Eric, could we make comment, even though this is public comment as board members? Um, that's generally the time for general, um, for brief board announcements. If it's public and you want to bring it up, you can mention it right now before I call it adjournment. Sure. I just think that we had, I, we have to mention one more time the, the, the comment bombing that happened. I think so it's unfortunate that we're adjusting the agenda for public comment towards the end where we, where we would otherwise have more public participants being able to speak. I realize that you're trying to um, remedy a situation that, that really caused us a lot of grief, but nonetheless, um, I don't think we should adjust public comment and put it at a time where the only way we'd, we'd be able to fix those bombers is by like ending the meeting. Um, it's just gonna stymie people's speech. The comments last week were beyond the bounds of any conceivable human decency. Um, I, it would be nice to dismiss them as um, not substantive comments and we could mute them, but the truth is they were very substantive comments. Um, in fact, they, they, they carried some of the most hateful substance that we can imagine. And so muting them on that basis wasn't, wouldn't have been appropriate, but there were other bases to mute them. They were clearly misidentified. Um, they were fake names, they were disruptive. There, there were ways for us as a board to carry out a meeting um, and, and nonetheless um, stop that disruption from happening. I don't think we, we, we tack on public comments to the end where it gives, let people less opportunity to speak and us an opportunity to end a meeting and not let anyone else speak or walk out of a meeting and not hear the public speak. To be clear, this is not intended as a long-term change. I know Freddie had said last week that, that some um, boards do it this way. I have no intention of doing this. This was purely because I was um, cognizant of the fact that it could happen again and I wanted to address it for a week or maybe even a month in November, um, assuming it doesn't happen. It's not my intention to continue this. It's just, it was okay. a short-term fix for a potential problem. I just wanted to cut it off before it happened again, for at least for the okay. short time being. Um, yeah, that's understandable. With that being said, let me revise my statement. 10.30, motion, uh, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you guys all. Our next meeting will be in November. Have a great night. Thanks guys. Good night everybody. Good night.